I'm going to go ahead and call this meeting to order at 501. Uh, will the clerk please take the roll? Thank you. Um, Member Newton? Here. <laughs> Member Bash? Yes. Member Allman? Yes. Al Al Allman. I said it right this time. Allman. Allman. Okay. I'll get it right. And Mayor Gunmeyer. Here. Thank you all present. Thank you. Uh, so today we will be having uh, the continuation of our recycled water uh, discussion. And so uh, the Director of Public Works will be uh, providing an update. So chats every day. It's all yours. Thank you very much. Uh, so we talked back in January. We had a, a workshop together, talk about recycle water, and decide about how we want to move forward with our potential system and opportunities. Maybe partner with RICRA and the project they're working on. So from that meeting, we had some discussions, some talking points, and certain direction from the council to come back with more specific information regarding some of your questions. Uh, we've also got some updated information regarding uh, the cost estimates we provided before and some numbers have changed to our benefit. Uh, so I just kind of wanted to quickly review uh, where we stand on this project and then kind of get your feedback and have some recommendations at the end. So uh, just to reiterate, just real quick, um, on this spreadsheet I have in front of you and on the table on the screen here, we have, and we've read this before, we kind of show our base work here as far as if we're doing our own system and working on our own and then if we're working with RICRA. Before we had a third option, we basically just pared down, it's either ours or theirs. So uh, just to reiterate, so our system was basically yeah, indicating that we have about 1,800 acre feet available of recycled water in total. Um, we currently have, Norfolk and Man's about 242 acre feet of water uh, available or an interest of it, which is basically the Navy, the majority, and the city parks. That's the only entities that are currently aligned with getting water. And then potentially water that might be available be sold in any way up to about 419 acre feet. That's a conservative number. It could go up, but that's our, we're assuming it's our bare minimum that uh, Inland Empire Utilities Agency would want. So we have a current system uh, that's in place but hasn't been used, it's antiquated, and we need to replace it. So in our current scenario, we talk about our $750,000 estimate to upgrade our existing booster station at Rick Rick that exists. Um, in addition, we also need to do improvements in our system, which is primarily adding a reservoir and doing uh, some certain appurtenances in the system to make sure that we provide water all the way across town uh, to the parks and to the neighborhood. So that's about a $1.5 million investment we need to make, plus the 750 for the rehab, which gave us about $2.2 million investment we need to do. We estimated our O&M to adjust our system is about $334,000. We then estimated that if we sold it for $2.20 a unit, we could make almost $400,000, which means we're, we're in the net positive. So we could do a project that we're in the net positive. Ripper's project, that's we've been talking about mostly what we need to do, uh, basically is seeking to see what member agencies, the JPA, uh, are interested in, are in developing one singular booster station above water north and south, um, and uh, partnering in that booster station and potential pipeline that will send water north to Inland Empire's uh, entity uh, for water that we want to sell to them. This scenario still deals with what we need to build in the city. The 1.5 million is still there. And then we're going to talk about what needs to be funded. In the past, we were talking about funding uh, opportunities, and what we had fund was funding the booster station and funding the pipeline that sends water. That was basically about a $3 million project just for those two elements, in addition to what we had to do in Norfolk. So we're over $5.5 million, pretty significant numbers. JCSD worked with their consultants, reworked the numbers, looked at some more. Uh, they kind of realized their their Cost estimates were really over conservative as far as what they were expecting it to be, and they really brought down their numbers to a more, more realistic where they were going to be. Um, so it really had a good impact on OM, and also they looked at their capital investment, how they can maybe shift around some of their grant money and, and to to try to maybe help the member issues. One of the things we highlighted to them and asked questions: Is there any chance JCS could finance any of this any of this cost on behalf of member agencies? So they wouldn't look at that issue. So what they did is, um, because the booster station, once it's done, is going to be signed over to Ripper. Ripper's going to manage it and, and operate it, uh, and basically own it at that point. Because it's going to be signed over to another entity, they can't use any grant funds towards it. So what they're using all their grant fund money is into the pipeline. 
And so they because and they can finance it using grant money because they also have an SRF loan from the state. They can finance the state pipeline. Fund. Yeah, sorry. Um, they can they can finance that portion of the project, the pipeline that sends it north that would send it uh, to Inland Empire Utility Agency, which is basically about one point five million was our original quote for us, and then the and the booster stations is another one point five million. That's how we got that original you know, three million dollars that we had to expand. So that's why we wrote it here that basically RICRA, we would cash fund the pump station and then we would uh, have JCSD finance that portion. And basically they're going to front that money, they're going to, they're using a lot of their grant money, etc. And they're going to charge us a fixed fee in our O&M from RICRA. And so basically what happens is we still have our O&M uh, that changes a little bit based off of what we're funding up here. This assumes, our number here assumes that we're paying back the money that we're fronting, and I'll talk about that in a minute. So our 1.5 and, and one and 1.5 here at the boost station and 1.5 for our Norco, the 3 million, we're assuming we're paying that back from whatever source we get it from. So that's why my O&M is a little higher than it was before, because this number went up a little bit in that process. So this is meant to just fund our costs internally at Norco for our staffing, electrical, you know, uh, future capital placement of our existing infrastructure, all the pipelines we already have in place. Um, and then the O&M here is strictly just the O&M for the pump station and the pipeline and a set cost for the loan that JCSD is giving us. So basically this is the, the loan itself is $60,000 a year for a 30 year period. So if you subtract the 60,000 out here, you basically get what our regular O&M would be. Uh, for the pump station and the pipeline. The prior estimate was like $212,000. So much bigger difference. And the good thing about this number that I confirmed today is that that O&M cost includes future capital replacement. So there's not going to be a cash call in 30 years, 40 years, say, hey, we need to give us $5 million to replace this pipeline or this uh, booster station. That's all assuming they are getting that portion of money needed to future replace that infrastructure. Because otherwise, I would have to add that back in here, and that adds more uh, money into that. So that's a good thing. So between what we have to expend, uh, or, or we have to obtain money for it, to, and then our O and M costs that we have here, we have about five hundred thousand dollars for O and M. What we can generate in revenue between uh, Norco's internal and what we can sell to the empires, we end up with just barely in that cost. Again, this is conservative, so it's that. For example, if we turn out, and this is part of reclamation, let's say we're able to get uh, grants, and maybe we get total from various sources to start, let's say a million dollars in grants. Well, our net service goes down automatically, but I have buried here, so that goes down. If we sell more water to the Lynn Empire, our cash revenue goes up. So that this is just to kind of show you that we think uh, overall that it's a pretty good, much better picture here that we're now able to reduce some of that debt because we're spreading it over long term through a loan, which is, which is really low through JCSD. Any questions on the numbers before I get to our recommendations? So, so, go ahead. No. Go right ahead. No, so basically if we go with scenario two, we would still be looking at the new reservoir, the new or all the things you have in side one. Correct. And that's reflected straight across. We still have that cost. We just don't have this cost. Instead of doing our own booster, we're doing this. So the Navy water, putting all that, that will also They'll all still be there. there. What changed? Primarily, their, their, their original cost estimates were too high. Uh, they were really, really over conservative on what they were throwing everything in the kitchen sink plus extra, and it was just, they realized they were over -counted. Plus, bringing in the loan really helps us. Yeah. That's a big change. Well, I mean, this isn't like a different deal. It's yes. very different. It's really completely changed. Yeah, it's a brand new pump station versus just getting ours running that may have more problems. Than yes. Just. It's a brand new pump station. Plunk it, yeah, on the routine, it's brand new. Versus the only thing we're going to get it running, but it's, it's still got antiquated equipment. Like the switch yeah. gear, the electrical is also the original, which is Which we've been told will work, but you yes. never know. Yes. Oh. Something else could pop up, and now I'm going, I need an extra 500000 to fix my electrical. So our recommendations. Yeah. Yes, sir. There's still some questions. Yeah. Oh. So back on uh, 
a Norco demand for 242 acre feet. How many acre feet for the Navy? How many acre feet for our parks and, and city of Norco use? I believe it's 191 for the Navy, and the remainder is the city park. And city parks, uh, water usage is paid. How would that be paid? It's already paid out of parks as part of their uh, fund. Okay. Um, and they're currently paying it at two dollars and seventy cents needed. This is a bare minimum of two twenty. We can go to two forty. We we make more money. We become more profitable. So parks just we we did a bare minimum seventy. Right. right. Currently it's two seventy right. for all four of the water. Okay. So if we went to scenario two, what do we do with our existing booster station? The existing one would be mothballed, and we would probably just let uh, RIPRA use that space as part of the existing or the new recycled water pump station they want to build. They were planning to build it really pretty much right next to ours or in front of our station. Right. Fit it in there, they would just use more of that real estate if we chose to give that up, which I would recommend. It really doesn't have a purpose at that point if we're going to invest in the new one. If we were going to give that up, how would that change the scenario to reduce our cost in scenario number two? It would not. But we would give, be giving up an asset. We would be giving an asset that's already on money. That's already greatly depreciated. That we're already having to pay money just to make work. Right? So if we wanted to get out work. Because I'm not, I guess I would ask you, what's your level of, in scenario one, what's your level of confidence on $750,000 if we have that booster station? I think for right now, based on the cost we're getting, it's going to be close. Uh, you know, it, it's mainly just, it's, Primarily equipment, we're doing some clay valve changes right. on the system and buying pumps. So it's not, uh, it's not caught, it's really just doing more of time than it takes to get pumps. It's mm -hmm. not a fluctuating cost that's rising or going up and down like asphalt or concrete or other, other construction materials that are more, uh, I think, uh, I think the right term is they just fluctuate a lot and we're riding up there. And so it, I think, again, it's still close. It may go up a tiny bit, but I don't think it's going to be all of a sudden it's a million, million and a half. That's all I have right now. My, go ahead, Kevin. My last question, just I, I, you said this, I just want to make sure it's crystal clear for me. The pipeline debt of 60K for the 30 years, so that'll be gone after 30 years. After 30 years. So then that'll come out. Mm -hmm. So then, I mean, by then the O&M costs will have gone up, right? But I mean, that part of that O&M cost will be gone in 30 years when the pipeline debt's gone. So we won't have to pay any money to use the pipeline as was in the previous scenarios, right? Right. So that's basically they kind of highlight in their formula. They basically show that is the debt service that eventually disappears in 30 years. And we're just doing the only down here from the pipeline, one at the pump station, and reflecting that. So why don't you go through kind of what we've talked about, Chad, on recommendations and how we might pay for um, the <coughs> other piece that we're not going to finance in cases. Can I ask a couple? Oh, I'm oh, so sorry, course. Robin. Oh, yeah. gosh. I need uh, to. <laughs> so, uh, you're showing that we have um, 1,800 acre feet available of recycled water, of which basically only 661 is spoken for. So there is the potential of more money on the table, correct? Should the system be built? Like, is it one of those things, we build the system, potentially they come, or we can get more clients or customers? It's a, it depends how you're handling it. If you're having to build more infrastructure to get those other customers, then you're not, you're actually probably gonna end up in a deficit because it costs you a lot more to build unless you get grants and a lot of other money to, to supplement that, you're going to have to pay that infrastructure back. If it's just, let's say, selling more water in land fire, then yeah, the, the pool of money just goes higher without an additional cost. Or, for example, let's say Corona decides they want the water for whatever number they agree to. The infrastructure's already there, we're not paying an additional infrastructure, they're just taking water from the plant, from the same booster station that they're using to send the water to themselves. So it's really just transferring our water to them and they would take it through that process. Can I add to you, the other option would be like as new development comes on, if they want to take advantage of it and pay for purple pipe, they can pay for purple pipe and that delta between potable and recycled starts to pay that back. Right. And then like Chad said, but like a lot of our neighbors, like Corona has built out a huge purple pipe system. Chad was saying, IUA's got came all throughout their territory up north where I was and Rancho, all their big purple pipe over time as grants and then private development. So you do get, if there is a little bit of you build it, they will come to some extent. Um, so for example, 
um, let's say the Wiley project. Mm -hmm. We've already talked with them and said I have there is a connection or a point of, of getting water from Corona right there at Park Ridge and Norfolk Hills Road. Mm -hmm. That's where we make the connect. We were told if you're connected there, they were just wheeling our water to our customer and that's water we'd be selling as part of that development. Uh, similarly, if there's a pipeline, for example, right next to um, the potential project at Second Street in Corona, I don't recall if they have a purple pipeline there, but if they did, same thing. We could have them connect and provide water just to their landscaping that's in that development if we felt it was worthwhile cost-wise you know, to do that. So we could serve that connection points, and that would be maybe our customer or just wheeling our water through them. So there's definitely opportunities, but the biggest issues is we want to expand, like do something for the up in the LMDs. We're going to have to put quite a bit of infrastructure that eventually has, that has to be paid back somehow in this formula. It just makes the cost go up. But it's a potential. Um, and then the second question that I have, uh, clearly at the last workshop, the potential costs were, in my opinion, obscene. So you went back and had discussions with them. Had you not gone back, would it have just been a, like, this is what we're going to do, we're just going to spend this money, and there would be no reflection on the cost or the buy-in? Like, because I just, I want to wrap my head around the reasoning of why now, like, this is more reasonable, but why it wasn't looked at at that kind of lens before, and are we going to be partnering with somebody that, again, is not maybe being as conservative with the funds as they should be as we partner moving forward? Sure, that's that a good sense? question. I think the initial one was their initial salvo of having the data that was done by a different consultant to get the information. Uh, I think all the parties came back with, we got questions. It wasn't just Norco. Uh, and they had another entity, which is Greenberg Stewart, which we worked through a lot of work Look at the information and say, guys, can you look at this to see if this is making sense to you? So they felt through that rewash of the data and the information, they feel that these numbers, and I asked them, are you sure? Because these are dramatically lower. That I, I don't want to come in, you know, they're going to doubt when I'm telling the truth because these are not like a little bit, these are a lot. Uh, are, are you confident in these numbers? Because this is what we're going to go forward with to making a decision. And we don't want the rug pulled out of this later on, and all of a sudden, I don't have a problem with the system making it handle itself. So they are confident that they believe that the rework of the numbers are more realistic and are more representative of the actual cost. Mm -hmm. um, and that's the assurances they gave me as far as the process. Because again, if you don't see the data, we don't know the numbers. But I have to take it on their expertise that they're telling the truth. And then the last question that I have for right now, uh, let's say we get an earmark for $1.5 million or whatever the case may be, um, where does that earmark go in, as far as taking these costs off sure. or lowering things? <laughs> I'll go into that right now with our recommendation. So what we're recommending is that we move forward uh, with joining the RIPRA uh, Recycle Water Project. We have to give them, they, one of the questions we had to ask is, when do you need to know about it? They said by May. May 1st, they want to know. So they can finish their design in June, and they go out to bid. Uh, so that's that process. They also, we also asked the question, when do you need the money? They said June of next year is when they likely would need the money. Because they're going to go out to bid, they're going to go through all the process of getting uh, the bidders in and doing all the work with them, doing submittals and getting the schedule, et cetera. And they figured they're probably not going to realistic start until June of next year. And they would like to see whatever contribution you're providing at that time put in the kitty so they can use that to pay the contract. They don't want to front all the construction costs at that point. But again, they will they are willing to fund the, the high cost. Um, the other option that, that we're looking at recommending doing is authorize the city attorney and the finance director uh, to work on drafting some requirements that we would take a loan from the sewer fund. Sewer fund has a lot of, of, of funding sitting there that we're trying to use for all of our sewer projects, but we, we can use money from there. Something that basically we would, we would put it down in writing that we're borrowing the original money, this three million, because that's what we're putting in pocket, minus the 1.5 that JCC is funding us already. So that three million is what we're looking at, say we want to borrow that from the sewer fund and do repayment over 30 years. To go back to your question is, so if we got, so because the goal is we need to move forward now as far as committing to them. Obviously, we don't have any payments to JCSD right now. But part of the work I need to do, which is the uh, last one, is I need to start beginning the design work on the reservoir portion. Because uh, that, if that's not in place, I can't take water when they're ready in 2025. So I need to get that design done so we can get a construction. It's not a significant giant project as far as construction. Uh, but at the same time, I, it, it does need to get in the queue because everything just takes longer. So I at least want to get the design 
going under this next fiscal year. So the part of the budget I've already included the CIP. Uh, basically, I'm asking for uh, I want to say it's 150 thousand for design. It's a smaller tank. It's about I'm guessing it's going to be about anywhere from two to three hundred thousand gallons because it's a much smaller system. We don't need to have a million gallon storage. But also the engineers will vet that out truly what we need and how we're going to maintain that to the actual determination of size. But our tentative plan is just to replace the existing tiny little tank and pumps that you see at Neil Snipes. That's the ideal location because the elevation, placing, taking that stuff out and putting it basically there. We might look at trying to push it farther back against the hill, you know, to make it a little less in view. We'll look at all the stuff as part of the project. And then the other item. So basically, can I interrupt just really quick on some of the sewer fund loan? So we're talking about like a legitimate loan agreement, like we would record and ask. No, just take it out and never pay back. Correct. So to Robin, to your question about where an earmark fits. So the the question is answers depends on what the earmark comes, when it comes, and who it's from. So the feds will never let you pay yourself back from money you've already spent. So if we get a federal mark, probably what we would look to do, like if we've already sunk all this by the time we get a federal mark, we'd probably spend it on more purple pie, more other things to go in the system. But uh, Chad and I are talking with the folks at SAPA about understanding more about these grants, but are really understand they are confident, like, hey, if you got it from the state revolving fund or you got these state loans, you can pay yourself back with that. Mm-hmm. So that's what we would immediately want to do. You're talking about power power comes yeah, I'm just wondering, like, if power yeah. comes through, if, if power that. comes through, yeah. It depends on the timing. Like if right. we haven't, if we get the mark and we get it this coming fall, then we could use an incentive loan potentially, right? But if we're not successful this year and it comes next year, we'd probably be looking for other right. things. So. And that's part of the nuance. So some grants want to be shown ready, which we don't have a design for ours to. There's already need to get design done. And like we indicated, some of them will let you pay back. The state has already said if we apply for a grant or we're given that grant, you can pay yourself back. And that's that's where we would either. We, we have multiple scenarios because we're not even paying anything. Construction's not starting on, yeah. on either of these, probably till next June anyway, for either of us, that we have time. So if we happen to get a grant and have money and it's not started yet, we can, we can automatically drop that money down that we owe and, and take that out right off the top. If something started, if it's federal, then we go, okay, what's our next option? So just so that I'm clear on the federal timeline and the way it kind of worked with the $800,000, the request was made. And then we heard around December or so that, yeah, it's there, nobody's messing with it, but then we got final notification like in like January, right? Yeah. Uh, so yeah. there's potential that even a federal could come in. Very possible. Okay. Very possible. And maybe we could use it, to, we could either use it A for our loan or to just pay, pay JJC them, right? and right. just not carry their money. But it's practically free money they're giving, so... I'm not super anxious to pay, not take their loan. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Chad and I were doing napkin math. It's like, I think 1% or something. So it's like, it's, it's I'll take good. that all day long. Like, you know, we'll make more on interest earnings than we okay. To that end, we really want number three, which is we need to hire a consultant that does this. We don't have an expertise in grants that can aggress, that actually aggressively goes out and knows these grants and knows how to help us make this be as successful and attractive to that grant as possible. We certainly work with uh, with uh, SAFA and they gave us all kinds of ideas of consultants that have They've worked with in the past that have been good in helping them address the grants, uh, but it was very clear you need to have somebody that knows this, has the time to do the legwork to go get that. Yeah, so, they were super helpful to us. Yeah. Like, I thought you had, you know, because he's on the, oh wow, mm-hmm. you know, that was part of them. And anyway, but they were like, they there's like a bullpen of different people they use that are like, have water expertise who know the state pots of money and are the people that they use to go write these big grants. So they gave us some names. Yeah. Um, it's just, it's, it's, it's out of our expertise, any of us on staff, we will, so if we're going to do that, we will need to appropriate some money to do, to get some people to help. And that would come out of the sewer fund? It could be part of the loan that we do. We could advance it as part of that loan agreement. We could definitely do that. And time frame on consultant to have the, the whole process to apply for grants, find out what's available. We'd love to do that now. As the guy, what is his name? Is it the guy like a six month on? process, eight month process? Depends on the loan. Because some the... loans are, commonly what I've heard is most loans are at least a year period of, of the, the process. Okay. The, the, sorry, when I say loans or grants, it's the same program that right. we're asking primarily for grants. We're not necessarily looking for loans, but we're not excluding it because obviously grants is free. Right. Loans is okay, I'm already getting basically a loan from. Uh, Sewer, I don't really need to pay that back. I'm looking for I can pay myself back 100%, not owe anything. But we're, we're looking at everything, 
And so from what I've, I've gathered from some of the discussions that I've had with sort of some of the consultants is that the process can go as fast as you want to get your applications in, but then it's waiting. Yeah. But the goal is, is, is as I told Lori, you read all these pages and pages of grants and they don't tell you whether or not your project is really part of this. I need, we need somebody that says, yes, we clearly know what you're doing. You're absolutely this grant, you're not this grant, you're this grant. Where I've had other consultants say, you tell us what you want to apply for, we'll apply for it. Like, I don't That's have That's not helpful. That's not helpful, yeah. So, it, and the, the SAPA folks are too busy. Really, this is like a once in a generation sort of opportunity because there's this convergence, right? Like the feds are dispensing money for like infrastructure and things, right? The state's dispensing money for drought, even though we, you know, we're getting better, right? But there's still a storage issue. And then climate resiliency. They've got all this money around climate resiliency. And this is really a climate resiliency project. I mean, it really is. So there's all these different pots of money where we can put recycled water. And he's like, this is probably a, an opportunity you're not going to have five years from now, right? It's, it's going to pass. So that's kind of interesting. And we have a good story because we already have a system that we were prepared to just need the final pieces. So you can say there's an excess that that money is going to making them 100% yeah. on recycled water. They can start finally using it. And it's not, oh, we also have pipelines too. We've got to do all this. The other thing that's really good is because we're in partnership. And they said all those grants really favor partnerships. So we're in this group of, of entities doing it together. That helps our cost too. So. Um, so the line on fifth, what was going on in bedroom nutrition was for a while there. We talked about maybe letting them have that. Uh, the recycled water line is just sitting there. Will we now use that? Well, we decided that just chair discussion that that wasn't going to occur. We didn't want to do that. So um, that's still there. Still they're still dealing with that issue, and we don't know if or well if or not they're ever going to go through with anything. They're obviously dealing with the bankruptcy issue. Um, they're still trying to figure out what their future is going to be. Okay, and then um, in terms of the lake, does that include the infrastructure you'll need to put the water into the lake? Yes. This is Amazing. Right? It's a way yeah. better picture. I'm with you, Ron. It's like, so can we get a better deal? Right. <laughs> so, Chad, what are you hearing from the other cities? Like, who else is it? Has anybody said now that this new information, like Corona? I haven't got to talk with anyone as far as um, other folks because they all, don't they have the, the current, they have the same concerns because they have money set aside for this. So, they weren't as concerned, but I think they generally they were wondering is this the true cost, et cetera. Um, but for home gardens, um, certainly they don't have a pot of money for this either. They're interested in certain Western sure it is. Uh, but we haven't really had a discussion about. I know Norco's been very aggressive in finding out are we in or are we out? We had to figure this out and what are the true numbers? So I, I can really only speak for us. A couple of comments. Uh, go back on that uh, condition of development you mentioned, like Wiley. Can, can we make recycled? A condition of future developments? That was my that's a policy decision. I don't see why not do it development by development or make it straight across the I don't see why you, not. You can't. It's just like the sewer requirement to have people go from septic to sewer. Right. You can absolutely say they must connect to uh, to recycled water with the certainty or with the condition of if it's available within some criteria. We right. need, you can't make them build, you know, a two mile pipeline to get recycled water. That's well, excessive. That's and I kinda of go back to North Ridge Range that there's purple pipe up there, but it's not complete, and it, it's been so long that if there is anything, it's disintegrated. Well, I mean, there's, there's sense, purple pipe in the sense that irrigation is purple pipe. There is not a purple pipe distribution line to get water up there. Right, but there was purple pipe run in that development. In the irrigation is purple pipe, and there, you don't have a distribution system to get water up there. Correct. That's the biggest and most costliest thing is to, if they had, if they had been forward thinking enough to recognize, put two lines up there, yes, make them all pull right now, but then when you get recycled water, you just convert one to no foresight. Yeah. So, so by, you need to make Yeah. Wouldn't it be great for the golf course too, but you need to put another reservoir. But I, I've been thinking about that. Do you see where I'm going with, right with, with a couple of future developments that we're looking at is, at least you get you know, plumb it in, irrigation to, to each site. And for Wiley, just so you have an idea, I've already basically told them that, because they said, oh, we can just connect to Corona and we can just get water from them, we don't need a reservoir. I said, no, you will need a reservoir. Right. And it's going to be right. up in the hill, right. because the point is, I want an opportunity that comes up in the future, is to boost it out of there, up into the hills, 
because we get money to build infrastructure right. to bring water to those areas where they have purple pipe for irrigation. Mm -hmm. Okay. So then, two more things. In, in that, when you were talking about Wiley and uh, other developments, you mentioned the development at Second and Corona. Mm -hmm. What development at Second Street and Corona? Oh, sorry, it's Corona. I meant uh, Second and River Road. Okay, sorry. Thank you. I'm just going. Oh, okay. Yeah, that was okay. And then the last is just a smart ass comment. Uh, with the reservoirs, uh, you will be removed from any choice of tank color. I was going to say, you want right now? You want purple? <laughs> yes. I thought the same yeah. thing. You don't, you don't choose the color house? of the reservoir. <laughs> Hey, I brought it to the group, and the group decided. Uh, yeah. I love this. So I'm not going to get it. I'm going to put that white end up there sooner or later. So it'll be now, better. that would look, now, if you did the white end, that makes sense. I, I really like it. I love the blue. I, so. put, I put an end on it, so but I don't want any part of it. The normal high school end. I'm painting orange and make it pumpkin reservoir, okay? Well, like, I just don't want the pumpkin. <laughs> 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 no, like please. Just one. So I guess that, just to clarify, Let's say Wiley, it's required. They come from Corona. And then you're right across the street from the golf course and the hills. Then again, another short point of connection. So there is potential to go back to that excess and start selling it out because we're slowly getting closer to. Especially with customers. the golf course, if there's source of water in, uh, on the other side of the hill, they lose it for some reason and they're going to need water pretty darn bad. And having a recycled water there is pretty easy to get for them, assuming yeah, there is a reservoir there and everything else. Yeah, all right, cool. You know, kind of bottom line for us is Chad and I were noodling about these new numbers. It's like there's always a little bit of risk, right? But if you look at the $3 million number, I mean, $3 million 30, 40 years from now is such a small amount of money. We're not risking $15 million or 9 or 7 whatever the numbers were last time. So for $3 million, it's a little risk, but not. It's a very measured risk, and I think long term, it really will prove to be the smart thing we would have done. I think 20 or 30 years should not be cool with that. I mean, especially for what you're getting. Yeah, no, that's exactly, exactly. I mean, this, this is really far-sighted. What would be the future projection on, on the Silver Lakes? And this is, okay, there's another potential, because JCSD is taking it all the way to right. that part, and we've already had discussions that if uh, so if ever want to become a customer, they would just take their straw and put it in JCSD, but that's our customer, and they would take water. So certainly so if had a really good structure, but it'd be our revenue, right? Yeah, our revenue. Yeah, it's just wheeling through. But they would, right. Silver Lakes or a city or whoever would have to basically build the infrastructure to take it into them, to wherever they want to go, assuming they want to go to the lake or something. Right now they're on their own wells, right? They're on their own wells. No, they're on the CDA wells. Uh, no, they're, they're, those are now City of Norco wells, which we are allowed them to use. We took ownership of those. And then their requirement is to eliminate those that they aren't going to use. And then hard pipe that pipeline. It's part of that, that uh, side agreement that we did with, uh, with some of the next wells. My point is they're not paying. They're not, they don't pay They don't pay for that. No, employees. right. No. I have two questions. Um, for the estimate that you have per acre foot for IEA, is that, what is that based on? Is that close to what they were kind of asking for with the with their proposal to RICRA? That is the number that they are they are paying the city of Rialto in a similar rate. So our assumption on this is that that is the minimum we're going to get. Because they are spending... Can they give us a, can they shop a number by RICRA? Uh, they about? threw a number down, it was, it was just... Really, just a waste of our time. It right. wasn't. They were just. So that, okay. It wasn't realistic. And then this agreement came out that they did with Rialto. Okay. And that pretty much set the stage. Okay. Okay. And they're, they're spending tens and tens of millions of dollars more than they spend on our project. They're paying the whole kit and caboodle, where JCSD is fronting about half of that cost for the pipeline. So it's a much different deal. So the economics we feel are only going to go up for us at two seventy five is the minimum. We're going to be asking for more. Because they are buying to get us, get our water is a lot less. Okay. So again, that can also make that number a little higher. Okay. And my other question is, have other cities required private parks or golf courses to use recycled water? Uh, yes, there are certain examples of cities that make it a condition to use recycled water for irrigation purposes, as long as the resource is there. And usually those entities don't want to fight that, 
But normally it's done as a as you come in basis, you must use it. It's not usually retroactive of I exist, you now must use this. Because it's usually I don't have the money to build this thing or that thing or a separate line for distribution because they're already on potable water that's through their whole system. They have to now you know, bifurcate it and kind of make sure everything's 100% um, separated. Do you know if the golfers is paying for their water? I don't. It's a private reader with a private property owner. I do know that and you probably know this too. There was, there was a strong push to have them get recycled water and a strong push for Wiley. And that council just we just let them off the hook on everything. They just let them off the hook. I would, I would definitely recommend that. It's true. It's true. true. Well, there was yeah. an era in this county where development just kind of ran its own show. Yeah. I would definitely it's recommend true. we look into the ability to. Uh, associate diff fees with any projects so that they pay into the recycled water system as a contribution as part of coming in. So I think certainly city attorneys should look at uh, what other cities have done because if we can get those in and paying a contribution, whether they're using it or not, that that's just part of the overall infrastructure, like other entities do with water and sewer, because that's money you could get. And we and again, while we have a system, which we will, <coughs> then we can have these major projects come in and contribute to that. Or have it such that, you know, for example, the project at River River Road and Second Street, that uh, let's say there wasn't an opportunity to get recycled water, but we basically have they make them buy in by reducing their um, their water demand uh, in dollars by saying I'm going to buy in, I'm spending a million dollars to get credit for this much water. That the city then goes and finds those customers to reduce that usage. You know, and we could already say, hey, you know what, our parks, which was you know. Some number less than, than the Navy, that's already a window. You could buy that credit because we've already paid to reduce our demand. So if you want that, you've got to pay for it. And you say, so for every acre foot, you're paying a fee of $50,000. You know, that gets you your, so if some, some apartment building or something like that has a demand of 500 acre feet and they want to pay a certain amount of money to, to get 100 acre feet of credit, they basically pay a fee for recycled water. It's a water offset. It's, not, it's an offset. It's not a true offset that they're reducing their demands, but they basically, we've tried to enable that. You can almost create a market for it. But you've got to make sure that legally you have it written down in the ordinances, et cetera, that asks for, number one, asks for contributions dip, and at the same time also gives them potential offsets. I know some cities have, have done programs like that. Well, it's time to do the uh, dip update. Julie's house is working on um, getting a consultant on board to update our dips. It's been a lot of years. And one of the things we will do this next fiscal year is I'll bring forward to you the actual ordinance that we have to adopt. Because we've already gone through the process, the state has already pre-approved our, our recycling water system several years ago when we were about ready to start something up. Um, so we already know our ordinance in general, but I have to make sure that nothing's changed, is up to snuff and they're good with it. And we have to adopt it in that form that says how we manage uh, our customers, et cetera, connections, things like that, and the use um, and how we manage it as a new water system. That would be one of the things we're looking forward to. So it's in place before we physically have to take water. So Chad, focusing on the success of this project, 10 years, 20 years down the road, the availability of 1,800 acre feet, does that increase? Potentially. I mean, we're mostly built out in, in mm -hmm. North over some areas. So we certainly, like, we have about 1.8 million gallons on average that goes to work for every day. Right. Even with some of the future hotels and developments, you know, you're only going to see that go up to maybe 2, 2.1. So there's more water there. So we certainly have more water in the pool, but, again, we're not even close to even half, so we're not, I'm not concerned about, you know, that even happen. at a total build-out. Yeah, I think you're about 2.1, 2.2 okay. maybe total build-out. It just depends, if, you know, like Corona, they're not building out, they're building up now. Mm -hmm. So that's why they're getting more demand on, on their water and recycling right. water, et cetera. But, you know, that's maybe not what we're going to be. There's no building up. It's just we're going to house car that. Yeah. <laughs> but that's, you know, it's just, if anything can happen in the future, and, but it realistically, based off our community and the type of lots we have, there's not going to be that much more growth. You know, unless you get that one industry that just loves recycled water and needs it to bad, like a new golf course. You know, you're not going to get this jump in demand for water that I, I see that's going to occur for recycled water. Okay, so you guys need like 
a motion from us. Some direction. Yeah, some direction. Yeah, some direction. Sure, we can take a couple of comments. Are there any public comments? You learned from there. me. <laughs> <laughs> no public comments. All right, no public comments. No. All right. So do we like scenario one, scenario two, with the recommendations? So the recommendations are, are these we would like you to consider and, and, and make a recommendation on? So we're recommending scenario two. Okay. Yeah, and scenario two on the process. And it would come back to you with you know the resolution with the loan agreement, the res whatever JCSD needs for the loan agreement, the grant um, authorizing us to with some consultant agreements, and then um, you'll see the number four you'll see later in the CIP. I'd make a motion to move forward with scenario number two and recommendations one through four. Do we need to take a formal vote on this? Second. No. I think you just take one. Yes. I mean, it's a recommendation. Yeah, absolutely. Good. Yeah, I mean, just can raise hands on that. Yep. All right, there you go. Great, thank, thank you. you. Great work by Chad on this. Um, so no, much better than last time. Right? Yeah. So much better. Good job. Thank you. Good job. What did you say? Yeah. <laughs> 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 I would I'll never speak like that. Yes. <laughs> All right, ladies and gentlemen, thank you. We are adjourned from our workshop. The council went into closed session on both items listed on the closed session agenda. No reportable action was taken. Council gave direction to staff. All right, thank you. So, ladies and gentlemen, we're going to have the Pledge of Allegiance met uh, by Council Member Bash, followed by our invocation from Rabbi Singer. Madam Mayor and City Council members, thank you for having me here tonight. As we gather here this evening, we call on God for guidance. There is power in assembly. Give us the wisdom once again to make educated choices, strength to make difficult choices, and hearts to make righteous ones. Words spoken in this gathering must be honest and open. In this undertaking, we must be ever mindful to treat one another with respect and dignity. The Hasidic rabbi, Zushia, taught his disciples that they must be the best of themselves. He said, when I go before God at the end of my life, God will not ask me, why were you not more like Moses? God will ask me, why were you not more like Zushia? So this we pray. Moses did not see the promised land. His task was to lead a slave accustomed band to march toward freedom. Can I do my share each day, we ask? mindful of the past, building for tomorrow. Not Moses, not Zushia, not any borrowed mask, but to be ourselves today. Ours is not to end the work, not even to start it. Ours is to give each day a willing heart, grateful for the strength, the wisdom, and the courage which have sustained us. Thankful for the success that has crowned our efforts. May we proceed from task to task, confident of purpose, resolute in the pursuit of our commitment, and ennobled by the innate worthiness of our goals. In the Jewish tradition, one must never offer a blessing without immediately following the words with the actions mentioned in the blessing. So as I bless this assembled group this evening, may your actions be suffused with a sense of the greater good, with a sense of responsibility to your entire community, but most notably to those who are the most vulnerable among us, the elderly, the infirm, the widow, the orphan, and the stranger. O guardian of life and liberty, may our city always merit your protection. Teach us to give thanks for what we have by sharing it with those in need. Keep our eyes open to the wonder of creation and alert to the care of the earth. May we never be lazy in the work of our community. May the members of this council govern with justice and compassion. May our homes be safe from affliction and strife. And may our city and country be sound in body and spirit. And we say amen. And I was also asked to thank you for opposing the uh, above ground uh, utility line. So thank you for doing that. All right. Thank you so much for being here this evening.
So at this time, we are going to start with the, our proclamations. So I'm going to go down to the podium and I'll call a few people to the podium. All right, so I would like to call the following folks to come up and join me uh, behind the podium. Betty Bash, Director of Town and Country Day School, if you'll come up, please. Right there. Diane Coslo, U.S. Navy, Division, of, Division Technical Director. Dr. Lisa Simon, Deputy Superintendent of Educational Services at CNUSD. Sue Bacon and the all-female board members of LNCF. And Nicole Brunk, owner of Brunk's Butchery. Quite a group we have assembled up here today. So ladies and gentlemen, we are proclaiming National Women's History Month this evening here in the city of Norco. I'm gonna read a few of the whereas is from our proclamation. Uh, whereas in 1978, the Education Task Force of the Sonoma County, California Commission on the Status of Women planned and executed a Women's History Week to commemorate and encourage the study, observance, and celebration of the vital role of women in American history. And whereas in 1980, President Jimmy Carter declared the week of March 8th as National Women's History Week, stating the achievement, leadership, courage, strength, and the love of the women who have built America was as vital as that of the men whose names we all know so well. And whereas in 1987, Congress passed Public Law 100-9, designating March as Women's History Month, and whereas the 2023 theme, Celebrating Women Who Tell Our Stories, recognizes women past and present who have been active in all forms of storytelling and who have devoted their lives and talents to producing art, pursuing the truth, and reflecting the human condition decade after decade. And whereas the city of Norco recognizes its local women's history and reflects on the strides we have made to ensure all citizens feel accepted and included. And whereas the city of Norco is a diverse community that is honored to celebrate the history and the legacies of women who have contributed to the economic, cultural, spiritual, and political development of our city, our state, and our country. Now, therefore, I, Robin Grunmeyer, Mayor of the City of Norco, on behalf of the City Council, do hereby proclaim March 2023 as Women's History Month in the City of Norco, where all citizens, past, present, and future, are respected and recognized for their contributions to our community. Perfect. All right, so we're going to uh, take just a few minutes if anybody would like to speak. I know like that's top on everybody's list, public speaking, but uh, is there anybody that would like to share a few words? Um, good evening. 
LNCF wants to thank the Norco Council and amazing city leaders for this proclamation. We are honored to help preserve and protect one of our most beloved treasures, the Norconian Resort, and the important naval history there. Um, Sue Bacon, our president, is in Texas helping a friend, so she wanted to be here to personally thank you, but her flight was delayed. Um, and Carl Druck is our male member who would also like to thank you. <laughs> Yeah, the Navy in Norco that's right back here by the fence just wants to thank the City of Council for this proclamation today and the partnership that we have and that we've had for many, many years. I see the incorporation date of 1964. We've been here since 1952, but in 64 um, with our technical mission, but in 64 we actually raised our mission and our flag. So it's exciting. We have 25% of our 2,000 folks that work locally um, are women. I have over 4,000 that work across the country helping to secure and support the warfighters so that we can have our warfighters go in to defeat the threat and come home safe. That is our mission. That's what we do. Um, and thank you for all your support. Um, Brunx Butchery would just like to thank the City Council uh, for this and uh, most importantly just um, share our appreciation uh, just from opening this business when we did in 2021. Uh, the support from the community um, and everybody within the City Council um, has been amazing. Uh, when we opened up we had our POS system on a fold-out table. <laughs> and and with all the support from the community and the people in Norco who have stood behind us and helped us get to where we are today, we now employ 15 people and are opening up a set and have opened up a second location. But we absolutely could not have done this if we didn't initially open up our business here in Norco where the people came and supported us day in and day out. We are honored to be here and we thank you. Good evening. On behalf of our Board of Education and the Corona Norco Unified School District, I just want to extend um, sincere gratitude for this recognition. And, rep and we represent all the wonderful women um, in the Corona Norco Unified School District, especially in Norco. I'm a proud um, citizen living here in Norco for 30 years. I love, love, love Norco. Um, we've raised our family here, our granddaughters here. And um, I, one of the things I can say on a personal level is how much I appreciate Norco for supporting women, always. I always have felt uh, equal. I have felt that I've had opportunities. I've learned from phenomenal women like Robin Grunmeyer, um, Mrs. Bash, um, Gina Boster, and it's just um, what we're here to do is continue that legacy of supporting women and not just women but guys too and um, we're really looking at supporting um, women of color. Um, we have a wonderful United States that we live in and we have a wonderful educational system in our community and we will continue the great work. Thank you so much. Town and country would not be here if it were not for Norco. I'm very honored to receive this tonight. Uh, we looked in a lot of small towns. We wanted this type of community to have our school in. We're known as Horsetown USA, but it's a wonderful place for children. And for this, I'm so grateful to Norco. We could never have picked a better community than this one. We have 20 employees and 18 of them are women. So. Uh, the men are, <laughs> they're okay too, but it, it has been great and we try to promote the women and they leave town and country and they go out into the system, the school system in different uh, areas. So anyway, I just want to thank the City Council for this award tonight. Thank you. All right, so at this time if my colleagues could come down and we're going to do a picture. Miss Amanda is already ready. So if you guys will come to the front of the podium and we'll oh, so, uh, well, but you're blocking me though. Okay. 
guys for coming. Thank you. That. Diane. All right. So thank you, everybody that uh, came to be a part of our pro proclamation today. Uh, it's one of the more um, kind of fun things that we get to do on council is recognize the awesome work that's being done in our community. So thank you all for attending this evening. We're going to go ahead and get started on our first agenda item, which is our city council reports on regional boards. So council member Alleman. Yes, on March 8th, I attended the Riverside County Transportation Commission. Um, big thing that came out of that was just the postponement, the suspension of work on the expansion of the metro station in the city of Riverside. And then I also attended the Navy Historic Properties Advisory Committee along with Council Member Bash um, and looked at some of the improvements that are being done with the um, different pieces there. And I'll let um, Council Member Bash elaborate if he likes. Thank you. Thank you. Council Member Bash. Uh, the the two most important events, I guess, was one the the Ted Hoffman Memorial. I want to I want to tell the Veterans Committee in particular. I was really really proud of the presentation that you made to the family. I, I mean, I thought Robin was wonderful, but I was just really proud of the veterans. You guys did a bang up job. I was just very proud of you. Um, I attended uh, in Ted's place the um, WCE, and uh, which was the dissolving of the the electrical debacle that we were part of and um I, I guess i didn't get it up there or maybe i did anyway i attended the last meeting which was interesting because i was the first person to begin that whole process and that was the very last meeting and then finally the navy stakeholders meeting that uh it was difficult it uh the the navy was under the impression that the Keeper of the National Register, while they denied our initial application, we had subsequently spoken to them and they said, please, they want us to bring it back. Um, I was particularly proud of our city manager because she held her own. I was very pleased with that. Thank you. And, uh, and that's about it. Thank you. I know I well oh and the 32nd anniversary of Norco College I went to that I was really really uh, very cool because uh, I said I'm the oldest member of the president's advisory committee uh, Norco College is doing some amazing things when one of which is as we've been trying to get the tech bridge which uh, Diane Coslow talked about um, that is very exciting uh, the escrow ends in June and uh, that is something that is going to be really great for the city of Norco and then uh, the Chamber of Commerce, uh, we were already supporting East Fell's bid to change their zip code, right? So we've already sent a letter and all that kind of stuff. So they, they want to have their own zip code. So that's. Thank you. Council Member Newton. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, good evening. Uh, Kevin, if I may add to uh, 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 Ted's uh, memorial, not only the uh, Great work of the Veterans Committee and, and the mayor, but I also wanted to thank staff and the incredible job you did with that. Um, on March 6th, uh, we had our uh, kickoff uh, RTRP um, uh, subcommittee meeting. That's Riverside Transmission Reliability Project. And um, I attended that with uh, uh, our uh, public works director, uh, Chad Blaze, but also it's a, a bipartisan group um, composed of a uh, assembly member of Saley, uh, Congressman Calvert, Senator uh, uh, Kelly Servato, uh, representatives from uh, Senator Roth's office, and assembly member Cervantes. And the, the gist of that meeting was basically uh, our goal was to need, find out clarifications of cost, and that's what we're tasked uh, 
to do before our next meeting, which is next Monday, I believe. And then on uh, March 9th, Thursday, we had the uh, subcommittee meeting for our bar uh, barn project and went over construction schedule and marketing. And uh, it's moving along as long as the rain slows down. Uh, that's all I have right now. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you. Uh, so uh, Council Member Newton already spoke to the Barnes uh, Project Subcommittee on the 13th. We also had the Unload Committee meeting. Happy to report that we'll be able to partner with some projects with Norco High uh, and Corona Norco Unified School District. So we'll have an event uh, coming up in April that we'll be partnering with Corona Norco Unified and then another event in the late summer, early fall when school starts over at Norco High School. So we'll have more information to come on that. But very excited about the committee meeting. Uh, we had a couple new members join us uh, and, it, and we're making uh, positive progress forward. So uh, with that, we're going to go ahead and move on to the next item. Uh, we are going to change the agenda order uh, slightly. We are going to be going to our appeal hearing, which is uh, item 6A. So we'll go ahead and go to our staff report on that, please. Good evening, Madam Chair. Excuse me, Madam Mayor, members of the City Council. Uh, let's see, get my presentation on the PowerPoint. Oh, thank you. So this is an appeal of the Planning Commission's approval of variance 2023-01, which was approved by the Planning Commission on February 8th, 2023. Uh, subsequent to that approval, the approval was appealed uh, by the City Council. So in a nutshell, uh, this is a request for a variance uh, from the minimum lot size requirement of 20,000 square feet in the A1 zone uh, after uh, to allow a lot line adjustment on a, par a vacant parcel located in the A1 zone. So basically what's happening here, the there is a, this is a lot that's vacant. This lot to the north is developed. What we have here is a barn that was built over property line on what was originally thought to be the correct property line around this area. So to move the property line this way, you'd be creating, uh, in essence, a substandard lot of uh, 16,444 square feet uh, 20,000 square feet, but after you exclude an easement for access purposes, you'd come down to a, a lot of 16,444 uh, square feet. And this requirement is based on the Norco Municipal Code requirement that um, when lots have easements for road purposes, you have to exclude that from the minimum lot size because you can't really use it for anything other than just access. And this is an encumbrance, not, uh, the city is not taking away property for, for um, access purposes. It's an encumbrance, a deed restriction, that this portion of the lot for access purposes is uh, used for access purposes only. So your 20,000 square feet comes into play after you exclude anything that's um, for access purposes. The Planning Commission made the findings to approval of a variance because of the unique characteristics of the lot. One of the characteristics being that there is this huge easement on the property. So that basically helped the Planning Commission make the findings for approval of a variance to move the lot line to the south uh, of the, um, excuse me, to the south. So as I indicated, the Planning Commission made the findings, approved the variance, and the variance was appealed by the by the City Council. So in, before I conclude, I'd like to point out that there was a uh, email attached to your staff report, and I'm gonna try to address that comprehensively, and I can answer any questions that the Council may have, so should there be something that um, they need clarification. So in essence, when there is a access easement for road purposes, you're not we're not taking away that square footage from the property it's just that it's encumbered for access purposes so everything after that is what you have to count for um, the meeting the lot size requirement of 20,000 square feet there is uh the property is currently still on septic the property to the north not the bacon parcel but the property to the north is on septic and there is a sewer lateral uh in front of the property that particular property uh, to the best of staff's uh, record and knowledge, the lateral is installed in front of the property on the property to the north correctly, and there is an existing permit to be able to connect. 
However, it's very close to the property line, and with the approval of the of the variance, it would basically solidify the location of that lateral. And in addition to that, um, it will allow the property uh, to the north, which has the the house, to eliminate the um, the leach field for uh, what is that uh, uh, septic, which is in essence eliminating a public nuisance and allowing them to connect to sewer. So that's that's a plus. And um, with that, I will conclude. Staff is is recommending that the city council uphold the planning commission's determination to approve. And I will answer any questions that the council may have. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Alma, for the presentation. I'm going to go ahead and start to my left. Councilmember Bash, do you have any questions of staff? Councilmember Alleman, any questions of staff? Yes, I had sent some questions in before, but just to confirm, Alma, um, for the benefit of everyone, we. We have already 1,584 lots that are under 20,000 square feet in the A1 through 20 zone. Mm -hmm. And correct. all of the findings necessary were made by the planning department. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Council Member Newton, do you have any questions of staff? On the lateral, is there a lateral to the property to the south? No, it's vacant. So I don't believe there is a lateral. I don't see them. So there's only one lateral in question? There's only one lateral, and it is on the property to the north. Uh, south Fork. So it's in the, according to our records, it's in the correct place for 3540 to connect to sewer. Okay, so let's say the parcel B, if that's developed, they're going to have to put in a lateral. Mm, that's correct. Okay. And connect to that sewer. Mm -hmm. And um and and sewer is available. There is a sewer line down uh South Fork. Within the two hundred feet of yes. Yes. both those properties. Mm -hmm. Right. Sewer main. That's all I have right now. Mm -hmm. Thank you. All right, thank you. So that will conclude uh, council questions of staff. Uh, at this time I'm gonna ask if the applicant would like to uh, address the council. Hello, um, I'm Teresa Back. I'm the property owner of the vacant land. And uh, so it's been four years since I bought it for myself and my horses. House on it. Um, I lived in Norco prior to buying the property. And uh, much to my surprise, there was encroachments on the property that I purchased over to title for help and ask you to support my decision um, for the lot line adjustment as the property owner and uh, other property owner to the north uh, that uh, supports this also that's all I really want to say, and um, you know, it's meeting everybody. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, go ahead. Um, I'm Lisa Anko. I represent Teresa Vaccarella. I'm her attorney, and when she said she turned it over to title, that's that's who I am. I'm from Fidelity National Title, and um, we're here tonight again. I, I might be a little bit repetitive, I'll try to be brief. Um, the city of Norco, as Ms. Robles told you, um, requires 20,000 feet for a square foot for a lot. Um, Ms. Baccarella applied for this lot line adjustment, um, believing that she was applying for a lot 20,100 square feet. But when you subtract for the roadway easement, it becomes 16,444 square feet. This is on paper, the reductions on paper. We applied for a variance, to accommodate this paper reduction, the um, planning director has recommended um, to approval of this variance in two staff reports. The planning commission has approved the uh, variance on February 8th, and we're here tonight for this, this appeal. We request that you um, give a determination that the planning commission um, uh, decision be upheld, and here's why. The lot line adjustment is the result of a settlement 
of civil litigation between property owners Teresa Baccarella and her northerly neighbor, uh, Nicolette DeCrisio. This litigation has been pending since 2018. Nicolette DeCrisio's mother purchased her lot in 1995. 20 years ago in 2003, she contracted with a contractor to build a barn with full permits on what she thought was her lot. They instead, the barn was built, as you can see, smack dab on the boundary line. The DeCrisio home also has a very old septic system and this boundary fence, which has been there for many, many years. As I stated before, Ms. Baccarella purchased her home or her vacant lot in 2018, believing that the boundary line was where this fence had been. But then she learned that the barn was on the property line and a leach field from this very old septic system was also on her property. She turned to her title company for help and this litigation ensued. So from these issues, this lawsuit has been pending since 2018. So a settlement was finally reached where these two ladies agreed that the barn would stay where it is, the fence would be moved slightly, the leach field would, or the septic and the leach field would be abandoned, and Ms. DeCrisio's house would be connected to the city sewer. I think there was a question from Mr. Newton about some laterals. Our civil engineer can answer that. We've reviewed the septic um, schematics for the area. Like we said, the uh, septic uh, sewer uh, tie-in, um, the sewer tie-in uh, permits have been pulled. So we have a lot of knowledge about that. Um, the main point that I want to make here, and I have given you pretty extensive packets with exhibits, um, proving that we have the septics uh, permits already pulled. But the main point that I want to make here tonight is that we've done everything that we can to make sure that this lot is sufficient for building permits, is sufficient for animal keeping, and is sufficient to stay within the aesthetics and the purpose for the city of Norco. And for the purposes of Ms. Baccarella, the lot is still 20,100 square feet. It's 20,100 square feet in her deed. It's 20,100 square feet for animal purposes or animal keeping, 20,100 for property taxes. The only time that you look at the lot and it's 16,444 is when you back out for the roadway easement. And then I would like you to take a look at one of the exhibits that I prepared just briefly and then I'll, I'll rest, I promise. Um, and that's the exhibit eight. And I've highlighted in exhibit eight just the area where the easement takes up. And this is the private road South Fork. This easement affects everyone up and down that street. Everyone up and down the street, all the homes benefit from this private road. But this road doesn't go all the way onto her property. Everyone uses up to where that black top is or what we call maybe a berm where the asphalt goes. And I've highlighted it in blue and that's Really, Ms. Uh, DeCrisio's area, or Ms. DeCrisio's home above that, you can see that she uses her property for landscaping or for her um, driveway all the way up to that blue area. And if you flip to the next exhibit, Exhibit 9, you can see a long view of the street. And you can see that the lots extend all the way to the blacktop. So again, we're looking at all the homes in that area and they still retain that large lot feel. And then in closing, I wanna say a couple, two things. One, there are a lot of lots in that area. My civil engineer, Mr. Jones, who's been helping us put this application through, um, has gone over and above and looked at all of the lots in the area in the vicinity and noted that there are many other lots that have this small lot um, variance or small lot approval. And we've attached that as exhibit 10. And he's here tonight to um, answer any additional questions that you may have. 
the purpose of a variance is to allow for any type of these non-conforming lots when there is a special condition like an easement, when there is a special condition like a barn that's been there for many, many years, like Violet built in 2003. So we would request that the City Council approve or the determination that the Planning Commission has made made back um, on February 8th. And I'm here for, again for any questions and Mr. Jones is also here for questions. Are there any questions? Councilman. Good evening. Um, I don't have much heartburn on the lot line adjustment. And typically this is just to, you know, clean up, uh, you know, if it's a foot off or a couple of feet, something like that. The the square footage is a little greater on this. And um, would you agree that um, basically we're, we're somewhat creating two new properties with this? Not in the sense that these properties have been this way for so many years. The misplaced fence has been this way for 20 plus 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 years. Then when you drive down this street, you're not going to be getting much different than what it's been. In fact, Miss Baccarella's lot is going to look and feel larger than it's been. And, and maybe this will have to go to you, Alma, but the footage reduces 24,000 to 20,000. On, correct. 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 But Actually, then in theory, with if you count the road, it reduces to 16,000. That's correct. That's correct. Okay. Right. But Which in. And then what I'm saying is, sir, if you, if you've been driving down South Fork. Right. For the last 30 plus years, you would have seen that barn or 20 years on the barn, but 30 plus years on the fence. And that lot would have looked the same. Right. But now with the new settlement, the way it is, that fence is going to move closer to the barn. Right now, that fence is 33.7 feet south of that property line. It's going to move closer to the property line. Ms. Baccarella's lot is going to actually physically, um, visually going to look bigger. And and yes, this but, but visually yeah, doesn't I, I, count. OK, <laughs> right. It doesn't, it doesn't count. What I'm trying right. to say is practically for the aesthetics of the street, it's going to blend right in as it always has done. And that's the purpose of the fair. It's to I, these non I, I won't argue on the uh, <laughs> well, my contention would be on the visual. I would rather. Sure. And I'll answer yeah. your question. The question is, Ms. Baccarella's lot is losing square feet, and but it's going to be 20,100 square feet. Right. When, you, when you subtract the roadway easement, not her fault, when you subtract the roadway easement, it's 16,444. Okay. And that's, that's to answer your question directly. Thank you. Any other questions? All right. Thank you very much. Did you have another question for Alma? <laughs> I'll wait till we okay for under discussion. Questions. All right, thank you. thank you. Thank you. At this time, I'm going to go ahead and open up the public hearing. Do we have any comments? Uh, we do have two cards. Okay. Uh, first one, Mary Jo Kelber, Colber. Sorry. Sure. Susie Carpenter is the other one. Thank you. Um, my name is Susie Carpenter, and I live at the house on the other side of Nikki. Um, I've lived there since 1995. Her mom, Violet, was my neighbor, and since she passed away, Nikki has been my neighbor. Um, there's been only three houses on our side of the street on South Fork for all these years, 23 years. Um, and then all the rest of the lots on South Fork on our side of the street have been dirt. And then they started building all the houses above us and blasting and moving mountains and changing all the landscape all around us. Um, and then whoever owned the lot divided it up and sold them off. And so since then, um, they've built a big house at the top of the street. 
They've now built a ginormous wall on the second lot. And then there is another empty dirt lot. And then there is Miss Teresa's lot that she purchased a few years ago. And then there's Nikki, then there's me. Um, up until Teresa bought this lot, we had no idea. Nikki and I have been living peace peaceably. And, and um, when I first moved in, it was the James who lived on my other side on the corner. We've had our fences. We've never moved our fences. Um, I've lived here for almost 25 years. and all of a sudden, Miss Teresa is knocking on our door saying, you're on our, my property. You know, our, your lot lines are all messed up. And we're like, what are you talking about? My house was built in 1959. I would assume I was, I was the very first house in that area built. I would assume they knew where to put their fences. And then the two houses that were built on either side of my property, that they knew where to put their fences. So to have somebody come and say, you guys are wrong after all this time, and the house is over 50 years old, and the city doesn't have that great of records on this stuff, which was even brought up last time from the lady who sat over here, um, we were all like, what is going on? So my poor neighbor, Nikki, now where we've been living so happily on our little street with our dirt lot, is now, gone through living hell dealing with this issue emotionally mentally financially it's been awful and then covid put a slowdown on all of it and i i had to speak because last time it seemed like you guys didn't know the whole story and i was glad it finally went in our favor and nikki was going to get a break because for these two to actually settle on this was huge and then to have it overturned it was like i mean <laughs> All hope was lost. It's like she's been fighting so long. So I had to come and speak up for my neighbor. It does affect me too, um, because they're saying my property lines are wrong too. But I'm not concerned about me today. I'm concerned about my neighbor because I want to keep her as my neighbor. Um, so I just beg you, um, last time um, they were worried about the property being too small. If you were to stand on South Fork and look at the, all the houses on the other side, they go straight up a hill. They gotta make little cutouts. This property is gonna have way more usable space than most of the houses on the other side. Um, okay, thank you okay. for your comments. We okay. appreciate them, but your time is up. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Mary Jo Colbert. Okay. Okay, thank you. No other cards? Nope, that's it. All right, at this time I will close the public hearing. And I will bring it back to our council for discussion and action. I'll start on my right, Council Member Newton. Thank you, Mayor. Um, Alma, when uh, I'm going to do this on Ted's behalf, that when Ted pulled this item, his concern was more of the, the footage to the center of the street, and that in 2014, when we changed that from, you know, the typical Norco half acre, not going from center of street, but to PL, um, were you asked to address that or comment on it? Uh, or was that brought up during planning? So if I understand your, your your question, are you saying when we went from a uh, minimum lot size of 20,000 square feet to 24,000, was it 560? Is that right, kind of your... Right. So your question with respect to that, um, was that considered or... Yeah, I, and I'm trying, because that's the reason Ted mm -hmm. pulled this originally, was um, concerned on that footage. I have another concern, but um, I'm, I'm just wondering if you had discussion on that from... Uh, where we were in 2014 taking things from the center of the street and then we changed it to go to pl well interestingly enough and and i can't remember the date but probably like 10 years ago plus and i think it was when our um some of our council members were on planning commission uh and ultimately the city council they adopted uh ordinance that prohibited uh private roads and uh you know private streets easements and that sort of and flag lots that is correct. Right. So the difficulty, and the reason being that it was a good justification, I mean, private roads create difficulties in, you know, determining access. In this case, it's excluded from uh, the, min the, the lot size uh, for determining the minimum lot size. So hence the, the issues with that. Um, 
and this is probably a good example of the issues that we deal we are going to be popping up once in a while right and the reason why we got rid of that so as far as uh that that is something to consider now when we changed the minimum lot size from 20,000 to 24, it was it's always been uh, counted as whatever is um, within the property after excluding mm -hmm. uh, anything for right away purposes. So, the, uh, of course, it's anything excluding um, the street purposes, the horse trail. Then after excluding that, that's where you come in with the minimum lot size of either 20,000 square feet. It was if it was created before, I think it was uh, 2000 or 2003, and half acre or two half acre after after that date okay so does that kind of yeah okay. yeah i'm just, was trying to just get a basis on that yeah um you know my, my feeling on all of this basically is uh like i said earlier to the attorney i don't have any heartburn on the lot line adjustment um in in some of the letters we received from the property owner talking about sewer laterals and things like that it's uh the sewers in the street it's within 200 feet of the property line uh, the lateral is there somewhat close um, the the fee that's uh, the property owner has been paying monthly is for capacity when you're when you're not hooked up um, when you have septic and you're not hooked up to sewer you still pay that no charge and that's just to reserve capacity at the Rikwa plant um, <laughs> What I have, and if Colin, if you think that you need to weigh in, um, with the reduction of one lot that reduces from twenty-four thousand to twenty thousand, and could be sixteen thousand, right? That I still contend that we're creating by this lot line adjustment two new lots. Okay. They remain animal keeping, though the one lot will be reduced, but um, I think you could still keep three animals on it, yes. approximately. Uh, what I'd like to see is um, a packet placed on both these properties as a deed restriction um, and approve the lot line adjustment. Um, we don't know what's going to happen in the future, whether that lot to the south is going to be developed, mm -hmm. the two properties could merge, but I, I'd like to see that we protect animal keeping with it. And this, like I said, this isn't just a small one foot adjustment. It's, it's got some serious square footage that's being adjusted and called for that. Uh, um, I think I, I could make the case that if, if, uh, the applicants uh, want to put a deed restriction to preserve animal keeping, then I'm fine with the lot line adjustment. And, and my concern then also is with the vacant property, because I have a feeling you're going to tell me, well, it's animal keeping and it'll, it'll have to have it. I don't want a sticky note in the file. I want something that's permanent that we know that there has to be animal keeping in the future whenever that may be developed and or merged. Any two cents on that, <laughs> Colin, no. or no? Councilmember Newton, uh, no two cents. You're, you're correct. The adjustment will change the boundaries. I think that the, the variances usually don't come with conditions, but one of the reasons that you can deny a variance is if granting of the variance will limit animal keeping on the lot. So if you can make that finding, there's a reason to deny the variance, which means there's a reason to not uphold the Planning Commission's decision. So the question about whether to mitigate that finding, you can put a PACA on it. I think that the best way to approach that, if that's Council's desire, is to ask the applicants, at the, both properties, if they'd be sure. willing to consider something like that. And if they are, then it sounds like we have a workout. And if not, then I think you have a reason not to not to make a finding on number five. Yeah, and the, the one finding that was made was it would not affect animal keeping, but in essence it does. It reduces animal keeping um, by two animal units. It still permits it, but it reduces it, mm -hmm. which to me affects it. So um, I'd like to hear from my colleagues on it, and then we can ask the applicant. But... 
like I said, I have no problem with the lot line adjustment and variance, but that's what I'd like to see is that we have a deed restriction to preserve and preserve and protect um, agriculture and uh, animal keeping. All right, Council Member Alleman. Sure. So, so I see this as a dispute between two property owners that they've gone to little litigation. They they've resolved it. They have a settlement agreement. Um, and so I see in this case, you know, the less government involvement, the better. Um, there's no neighbors that have opposed it. Um, neighbors, in fact, have written in support or showed up in support. We have a number of lots that are already irregular. And in speaking to, you know, so if the issue isn't then changing the lot line, um, our, our city codes already require a PACA, right? I mean, whether or not they have it deed recorded, they're, 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 they're maybe the PACA is not the right word, but an animal keeping area, right? They're, where there's, where these lots are still required to have that, whether it's in the um, deed or not. And I know um, these are some of the questions that we asked behind the scenes before this item came to council in that if we were to um, put a PACA, uh, deed recorded PACA on the vacant lot at this time, it would then have to be possibly moved. And so those are usually put in place when you know where the building is going to go, the house, since there is no house, it's kind of arbitrary where we would select to put it. Um, but that we can certainly, um, you know, I know that's kind of like that sticky note that you said. Um, but, you know, placing one right now is kind of just put something that then has to get undone and redone, um, but can certainly record it. Um, and then my question is, I, I mean, I guess not a question, just to come back to what um, what Colin said is that, you know, usually there aren't, we can't place conditions on on um, on a variance. So um, in terms of kind of sending this this back um, after hearing what our residents, you know, have gone through to try to find a solution to a problem that they have inherited, um, I think that they've done a good job of coming to a resolution between the two parties. And certainly we want to see animal keeping. Certainly on that new lot we can, once it's decided what will be built, have a paca there um, and have it recorded. Um, as far as the other lot, I, I'm less inclined to, to, to deny it um, for that reason because I, I think that what we have in our community is strong enough to make sure that there is space for animal keeping there. So... Thank you. Council Member Bash. So is your intention to build a, a home on the, the property? So, I'm sorry. So for me, okay. So uh, it looks like you guys came together, and uh, I, I actually felt very badly that it was a battle. Norco's kind of famous for those kind of battles. But what Norco's really famous for is holding the line. Um, I feel badly that you went through what you've gone through, and, and I know the process seems really can be horrible, but we're the last one. And the reason is is because... Planning Commission after Planning Commission, Council after Council has stood their ground and said, we are going to create this community. And the attacks on this community right now are horrific. Um, Sacramento is crazy. And so I really feel badly went through this, but that's why we want to live here. I mean, when I first got on council, there was no Eastvale. There were 40,000 people less in Corona. I mean, you've all seen the traffic that surrounds us. We're a patch of green surrounded by a sea of concrete. 
but I do feel badly you had to go through this, but I see agreement. Um, I don't have a problem with the lot line adjustment. And if a house is built there, then we have built a house and we're in keeping with what California is enforcing and we've built another house. And so I'm going to go along with the, the staff recommendation on this. Thank you. Any other discussion from council? Yeah. So uh, to my colleagues, um, and I guess to the property owner, I just want to make it clear that um, I'm supportive of the lot line adjustment. Okay. My concern is, and, and you mentioned it's yourself, that your intent is to um, sell the property and you're going to, the intent would be to sell it to, um, <clears throat> to <clears throat> animal keeping folks. And as we well know that you, you can't, can't promise that. And what we're seeing in town is there's people that they don't care about our animal keeping, you know, either flip it, develop it, <clears throat> build your ADUs, whatever. So, um, I don't think you can guarantee that you're going to sell that property to an animal keeping family. Um, so I, I guess that's my part of it that, um, we need to protect the animal keeping and, and unless you can find me a remedy that says that we're not creating new lots. I, I look at this as you're changing the footage and it's by a substantial amount, you're creating a new lot. And our code does say any newly created lots require a deed restriction, a PACA. My understanding of the subdivision map is that in essence, when you're just adjusting a lot line, that's not creating, but I understand where, where uh, Council Member Newton is, is saying, you are creating, in essence, the square footage is changing, so therefore you're, the characteristics are changing of the lot, so they're new lots. But the reality is, is that when you subdivision newly created lots is for subdivisions where you're creating new lots. In this case, you're not you're you're still ending up with two lots. You're just basically moving the lot line, uh, in this case, to further to the south. So you're in essence you're you're starting with two lots. You're ending up with two lots. So um, and this is just my recommendation, staff recommendation. Again, uh, should this property this vacant parcel to the south ever want to be developed just based on the characteristics and this has been the characteristics for all the properties to the south they will more than likely have to apply for a variance to be able to put a house on there N number one being is that there is a hundred foot rear yard setback mm -hmm. two lots to the south they weren't able to meet that not because of, it, it was mostly because it's you know they're not as deep lot, minimum lot size is 2,000 square feet. And on top of that, you have that road easement. So it created a unique situation situation, to where we were, be able to, we were able to approve the variances. So more than likely, that is going to be the case here. If and when we know where the house is potentially going to be set, should this be developed, we'll know where the house is going to sit. And that way, we can situate the PACA in, the, in, in a meaningful way where it's going to, number one, allow access to it and make provision for the number of animal units. So you do have that ability to uh, make sure that this lot is uh, animal keeping indefinitely. Um, if as of right now, as it's just right now being an, a, a vacant parcel, you can use the entire parcel for animal keeping. It's a permitted use without having a house there. So you can absolutely. use it. Yeah, right. absolutely. But when you start encumbering it with uh, with houses and stuff like that, that's where the, the lot, it gets more restrictive and that's where you want to put the PACA. And historically speaking, based on the development to the south, that's what we've been doing as far as making sure that the lots remain animal keeping with development. So staff recommendation is that yes, you, we can look at it it's, and it won't be just a sticky. It's something that will be. Um, uh, and, and how would you ensure that, <laughs> that it won't be a sticky note? When, if and when the um, development of the, pro of the property is proposed, uh, and it doesn't meet the setback requirements, which more than likely it won't not, when they don't have enough room, because you end up, if you apply the 100 foot rear setback, you, win, you end up with a building envelope of about 10 feet. It's not gonna work. So more than likely they will be required to do a variance. And with the variance, uh, the, uh, we'll have to 
the finding will have to be made that it's still an animal keeping lot and the way that's made is by requiring a recorded um, animal keeping location. And that's been historically what's been happening with all the lots that are being development, mm -hmm. uh, especially the one to the, the south, the furthest south, and then the one next to it. Uh, they all had to go through a variance and they all were required to uh, provide animal keeping. So that's staff recommendation anyways. And I'll I make sure of it. I have to compliment you, Alma. And very good report, and 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 you defended your case extremely professionally. <laughs> Always proud of you. Okay, thank you, Mayor. All right. Any other discussion? I'm going to agree with uh, Alma that uh, the PACA can go uh, when development, if and when development should occur, and there's um, ways to get that done. Uh, with what already exists. So uh, with that said, I'm going to make a recommendation that we uphold the determination of the Planning Commission and approve variance 2023-01. Second. Okay, it's been moved and seconded to uphold Planning Commission. Will the clerk please call for the vote? Go ahead and vote. Mayor, your vote's not coming through at all. Yeah, I'm not seeing anything. I vote yes. Oh, here it comes. Okay, motion passed 3 1. All right, thank you. So at this time, we will uh, go back to our regularly scheduled agenda order uh, so we will be going back to item number two which is our consent calendar uh, are there any uh, items that my colleagues would like to have pulled motion to approve all oh wait well, i can't do we, sorry hold sorry. on council member <laughs> are there any cards no cards thank you council member bash motion to approve all second Yay. Go ahead and vote, please. I vote yes. Thank you. Motion passed four zero. All right. So moving on to item number four, uh, which is uh, public comment. City clerk, please. Thank you. I do have some cards. Uh, Matt Jefferson. Mayor uh, council members, staff, thank you for giving me the opportunity. I'm going to take an extra time on the clock if I don't want to go three minutes. Thank you. Uh, I'm here tonight to ask you about our new parking lot, our new municipal parking lot at the corner of 6th Street in California. It was recently fenced in. Um, I have to applaud the city council, council members, especially council member Bash, for putting this forward and tying the property but unfortunately has some unintended consequences with the fencing uh, one i think is a public safety issue um, making the turn with a trailer as you go from uh, eastbound sixth to southbound on california becomes very very dangerous because now people are parking along the street the first several hundred feet becomes very difficult to navigate because there's a turn signal that or a turn lane that has a turn signal that goes from California, then westbound onto 6th. Uh, the reason I know this is for 19 years, I've lived on California and 5th. So we use that exit to go from California down Hamner to the rest of Norco. I think generally there is some unintended consequences from the fencing in of this property that I wanna ask what the spirit and the ideal of this fencing in was meant for. Obviously, there are people that park there on the weekend in the past. They would trailer in, and they would then go explore parts of Norco. It's a very popular ride from 5th, down 5th into Old Town, 3rd, 4th Street. A lot of people would exercise, and they would park their trailers there. That lot has been locked since the installation of the fence several weeks ago. It's not been open, at least as far as I can tell, during the time that I go up and down that street. And if your intention is to encourage people to go and park there, 
and attend businesses that are either across the street or around the corner, you've also limited that economic opportunity. And I wonder what is the message we are sending to our community neighbors, people that live next to that property. Today, I barely miss two waste management bins. I know the scout service well. If anybody wants to talk about scout services, I can talk infinitum about it, scout services. I don't want to be disingenuous, but I think about the parades and the kids that back their trucks up to the double vinyl fence that will no longer be able to enjoy the parade that we have several times a year down 6th Street. I just want to ask, when we measure liability versus revenue, tax revenue especially, uh, for those businesses that will no longer be able to have additional parking, I feel like there's some way to address the spirit and the intent and the neighborly approach that is the city of Norco to allow other people to come and use that property. And I will leave it at, I thought it was supposed to be partially fenced off because I had heard some rumors that it was gonna be a maintenance depot, but clearly that has not happened. Thank you. Thank you, Jim Pollard. Uh, good evening, council. Uh, I want to thank Robin Grunmeyer uh, for the services of, for Ted on uh, this last Saturday. Um, I'm kind of here to stress the fact that we've lost so many people up there at Ingalls for voluntary services. Actually, I'm the last one. We lost Shane Porter, Ed Dixon, Ted Hoffman. And uh, we have so much equipment up there to be taken care of that isn't, I'm not capable of doing it all myself. Part-time people can't take care of the equipment that this city has invested in. And um, I just kind of venting that uh, we need to take care of that property, that equipment, and uh, for the loss of Ted and everybody else. Um, I personally can't take care of it myself. And, uh, but I thank you for, for everything that this city has done. Thank you. Bonnie Slager? Good evening. I um, appreciate that on the city Facebook page, I believe, you put about our meeting tomorrow night, and I want to make it clear to extend to everybody the Norco Horsemen's Association meeting tomorrow night is open to everybody, and our speaker is Tom Delapi from the property. He's, his father is part owner of the property on Bluff and River, and he's going to be uh, explaining what they are planning to do, hoping to do with the property, I should say, and so I hope that many people in the community will join us tomorrow night, that you folks will be there to join us and uh, ask your questions. I understand he's going to have other um, opportunities. So after our meeting, um, if you have questions, I understand he's going to have some more opportunities to show off. So uh, again, I want to extend an invitation to all of you council members and everybody in the community to join us tomorrow night seven o'clock at the American Legion. Thank you. Thank you. Jody Weber. Good evening, council staff. Wow, it's been a while. So um, I'm here as the secretary on the board of the Lake Norconian Club Foundation. You might have seen all these wonderful flyers out there. So um, just announcing our upcoming fundraiser on, uh, let's see here, I think it's May Memorial Day weekend, May 27th. It is a Lucy and Desi inspired event under the stars in quite a number of you in the room actually joined us at Galliana Winery. So it will be in the same location. Um, 
So we're just um, asking um, that you attend this year. You can check us out on Facebook and all of the social media events or social media things that we have. And we're just looking for your support. So if you need any, there's flyers out there. If anybody wants uh, any other information, they can come and see me. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Greg Bowen. Uh, I want to thank you for letting me talk. Um, thank you guys for, Ted was a really good friend of mine. And just like a lot of you on the council, I know you guys. And I want to thank the city for what they did and how you guys took care of Ted. And if you need help with the arena, I'll, in my 20s, I couldn't fill Ted's shoes. If you need help, just give me a holler. We'll be more than happy to come up there. Uh, but the reason I come up to talk is about Norco's been a, we want Norco to be a destination area uh, for people with horses. And I've been here my whole life. And I've seen Norco progressively cutting out stuff, making it harder and harder for people on horseback to come here. Uh, all of a sudden, our arenas are closed up in Ingalls Park. You can't go up there. The gates are locked. You have to park in front of people's houses. They complain. You know, I have my friends come from Rancho or Yukaipa. They come down, and they're having to park in front of people's house. And I have to go out and make sure they don't park in our trails, which I, I'm good with that. But that we have places we can have them go park, and they can go ride out on our trails. But we don't offer that. I don't know why. Now we have that new lot with it's all fenced in, and it's locked. And I'm just confused. Why is it locked? Why aren't we opening it up? Um, um, yeah, the businesses are going to... Uh, are going to get use of it across the street. That, that's just, that's okay in my book. But what we're losing is people getting through at Ingalls Park and they're not spending the money in Norco now when they leave Ingalls Park because there's no place to park their trailers. There's no place to park your trailers at Rodeo Burger unless you have a small trailer. You can't go park your trailer at Jack and Box. You may be at Chevron if you cross, you park across the pumps. But there's no place for them to go to the Ingalls Park when they're through, stop, eat, drink, and do whatever. We're basically saying you need to go out elsewhere. Um, that's basically what I came up to say. And I want to thank you guys again for everything you did for Ted. And uh, he's going to be missed. Thank you very much. That's all the cards, Madam Mayor. All right. Thank you very much. We are going to go ahead and go on to our discussion and action items. So our first item this evening is going to be a 5A consideration of the establishment of a George Ingalls Veterans Memorial Executive Commission. Our report this evening will be from our city manager. Thank you, Mayor. Um, so we have this evening, last meeting, Councilmember Rash had asked this item be added to the agenda, consider the establishment of a commission where we've had the executive committee previously. So provided you a staff report, this is meant to be the starting point for a discussion around this um, idea and option. Um, a little bit of background, the executive committee was originally formed to support the establishment and operations of the Ingalls Veterans Memorial Plaza. And it, the memorial, since the memorial was authorized by the council in in late 2013. Um, the members of the committee have continued to work in support of that memorial, working in collaboration with the subcommittee of the city council. So most recently that was council member Hoff Men and Councilmember Bash. Um, and council, uh, Mayor Pertem Hoffman was actually chair of the committee until his passing. So uh, the committee continues to do all kinds of great things. They have a docent program at the memorial. They help organized activities on major holidays and so forth, the Memorial Flag Day and so forth. So what we've provided for you is a place to start a discussion around making this into a commission. And we, we would concur that transitioning to an official commission status would provide greater clarity about the commission's role, uh, provide appropriate structure, staff support, and an opportunity to, for a mechanism for how folks are appointed to the committee. So um, I, I got a chance to briefly discuss this at the committee's meeting on March 6th. And I know some of those folks are here tonight. Hopefully they'll have um, share their thoughts with you also. I will say generally while they had 
concerns and questions that they were generally supportive and positive about transitioning to become a city commission. So uh, city council, you have a lot of latitude and discretion about how you structure this commission um, in a future ordinance. So I've given you some ideas as a starting point. Uh, the first idea was to recommend that we retain the name and just swap out commission for committee. And also to ease the transition, I'm recommending that the initial commission be composed of 14 members whose appointments would be of the existing members to initial terms. That way the folks that are serving in active roles on the current committee don't feel that this change impacts their ability to continue to serve for, it, for this time. So you can still appoint two members of the city council, appointed by the mayor like we have been. And then with regard to the 12 other seats, again, I would recommend we appoint the folks that are there today, but they could all be sort of at large members to allow maximum flexibility, or they could mirror the current structure and, and represent certain stakeholder groups in the military community. I think the, uh, the members at the committee members at the meeting um, last week or the week before um, sort of vacillated about what they thought about that. I think there are pros and cons to both. Um, the more we narrowly define each seat, the, the narrower the applicant pool gets, right? So if you cast a broader net, potentially you have more um, folks, a wider, broader folks that can fit those spots. Um, membership could be in a range of composition rather than a fixed number. So it, numbers could change over time depending on how many are interested in serving. So we've got 14 folks serving today. We could have a minimum of say seven. And so at some point, if there's only 13 folks who are interested, we could have a smaller committee. Again, you have a lot of flexibility in the ordinance. And I would also note that you know, service on the committee is not the only way to participate in a volunteer in support of the Veterans Memorial. We would continue to welcome volunteers who want to help for example, be a docent. You don't have to be a member of the committee or the new commission to be a docent at the memorial, right? We would love to see lots of folks be involved in the programming and activities in support of the memorial, not just being on our, our commission. Uh, veterans, members could be veterans or dependents slash family members of veterans um, or others that have demonstrated a support and involvement in veterans organizations or causes. Again, this was briefly discussed with the group. Try to provide some, again, flexibility, try to have a big commission and a robust um, membership. The duties would remain the same, and I, I've attached a copy of the policy paper that the executive committee has been working in accordance with for a number of years. I believe this dates back to when Brian Petrie was here. Um, uh, Councilmember Bash might recall. They put together this paper, sort of their working norms and what they would expect for themselves as a group. Um, the group can continue to kind of have these informal working policies for themselves, uh, it, but again, it would be more um, under the purview of the city more specifically, right? And you could also have a student member. You know, we've recently added student members by resolutions to many of our commissions. And so we certainly could add that to that resolution and provide a student member if we would like to do that. So our recommendation tonight is really that you discuss kind of your, discuss this concept, see if you're in support of creating a commission and provide some direction to us uh, regarding how you would like to see that come back in an ordinance. Thank you. Uh, does council have any questions of staff? Lori? We're going to start with Greg. Thanks. <laughs> um, no, I, I know you're trying to reference this as the commission, uh, but it says the committee could still include two members of the city council appointed by the mayor. Not required, though. I think I'm trying to frame members. this into options for you. I think there was a question that I'd received about could a commission include members of the council and members of the public? And my answer is yes, absolutely. By ordinance, you have a lot of flexibility. So okay. you're correct. So that's my misspeaking. It should say the commission could, should still, could still include two members of the council appointed by the mayor. But it could be one also or? Sure. None? Sure. Okay. Couldn't be three. Right. And then... Uh... Who would appoint these commission members? So I would assume they're appointed just like you appoint other members of your commissions by the city council. Okay. That's all I have right now. Mm -hmm. Council member Oliver, any questions? Council member Bash, any questions? Okay. So we will go ahead and move into public comment. Do we have cards on this item? I do have one, Jeff Kayon. Thank you. Good evening, Council. 
As the acting chair, I'm here to just uh, speak on behalf of the committee as it exists today. Um, City Manager Lori was nice enough to come to the meeting, as she mentioned, and we really don't have a problem becoming a commission. We understand the, you know, the requirements of what we do and the fact that um, we should fall under the officialness of being a commission, so that's really not an issue. And she listed a few of the options um, on the staff report on page two where she talks about you know the, the makeup of the committee. When we formed the committee, and it was, I'm sorry to correct you, but it was December 5th, 2012, when the um, project was officially um, approved by the council. So the policy paper was just something that we came up with since we were sort of not official, but yet official. We still wanted a policy document to explain our makeup and how we proceeded with processes and rules and things for uh, how we vet people to go on the wall and to have ceremonies and things like that. Um, so real quick, we don't have a problem um, modifying the requirements of who the members are. We sort of agree with the idea of making it a lot more flexible. Um, we currently have Don Farmer on the committee because he's the representative for the Riverside County veterans. He lives in town, so it's real easy. Who knows, in a couple of years, maybe that person that represents the county lives in Temecula or somewhere and really can't or doesn't want to come to Norco. Then if we allot a seat for that position and not for that person, we may end up having an empty seat for a few years. Um, so making it more flexible, the council then gets to make the decision of from the applicants, the bigger pool of applicants, who you would want to be um, as members. Um, for instance, there's also the recommendation, right, to have a student. I would assume that we would want that student to be a member of either the ROTC or the Sea Cadets. But if we don't get any applicants, we certainly would want a student of interest who wants to be on the commission. So we wouldn't want to restrict it per se, like, you know, uh, Lori was saying. We have a seat right now for the commander of the American Legion. If in the future that commander doesn't want to be part of the committee or the commission, then what happens to that seat? So by allowing more flexible, it, it gives the council more discretion on who to appoint. Now, as recommended, we have the 14 members right now. On a normal commission basis, you would then probably end up with, um, let's say we stick with 14 or 15. You're gonna have to figure out, do five members get reappointed in year one, the next five in year two, and so that there's a little more staggered, or you know, you guys got to figure that out kind of thing too, as far as how that goes. So, but yeah, we're certainly in favor of it, and again, just we're leaning more toward the flexibility to give council the leeway to make up that commission however you see fit. We're we're in support. Thank you. No additional cards. All right, thank you. Uh, at this time, I'll bring it back to council for discussion and action. Council Member Bash. So the reason this came up is we, we actually throw a lot of resources at this commission. There's times when you have five, six staffers sitting in that, in that room and there's nobody taking minutes and it's, it kind of needs to be more official. Uh, it is a city asset. At the same time, we want to foster the volunteerism. I mean, this was created initially to build the memorial. And uh, I think that we're now at a place where we need to sort of elevate that commission. Um, I like the idea of the flexibility. I wouldn't. I wouldn't. I want to. I want to try to make sure that that we on that commission there's somebody from the junior ROTC program, the major or who's ever there. Uh, we were lucky. We had Dave Spratley who would be part of it. Um, I think. 14 is a good number. I think uh, Jeff's suggestion that we stagger the appointments. Um, I think that the policy paper is a good place to start. Um, one of the things that I would like to see is maybe just a little bit tweaking of the mission statement of that particular group um, in terms of what their the responsibilities are just something uh, and in tandem with that part of the reason I wanted to form a commission is I I want to form a separate nonprofit wing that will help to fundraise and 
that would be another opportunity for people to support the memorial without actually being on the commission and maybe attract people from around the area, not just Norco proper. Because one of the things that we've added is the Gold Star Family Memorial, which is built specifically as a regional um, center point for Gold Star and Blue Star families. Um, I'm not sure how to proceed. Um, I, I think we have a, a loose outline as what Lori's laid out. I think what I'd like to see is maybe we take it back to the committee and get their very specific input, or would you rather go to staff and work something out? Now, how would you like to proceed, Lori? Um, I think either way is fine. I'm curious about uh, the, the other members of the committee that are here tonight and uh, Mr. Cahan, if they have feedback on that. I feel like we have sort of the guts of an ordinance here. That's what I think. So so if, if the guts of the ordinance makes sense to the council, then what we can do is craft the ordinance and bring that back probably the second meeting in April. And then the community, the committee, the council can chew on that and revise from there. But I think, I feel like we're kind of there in terms of consensus. That's my feeling. I just don't, I don't know what the next step is. So we'll, we'll write an ordinance. We'll draft an ordinance that makes it so, essentially. So that, that would be my recommendation. Go ahead and proceed in that direction. Let the let the committee proceed as it's going now. Uh, we have Memorial Day coming up, and uh, they seem to be functioning fine at the moment. Um, it's just I think it'll elevate their their position. So my recommendation would be just to do it, what the city manager suggested. Okay, thank you, Council Member Alleman. Yeah, so we discussed this back in um, December of 2021, and, and I've been in favor of it since then. You know, it really shows what we value in our community, which is our veterans, and it elevates the standing of the commission. A number of cities have commissions for veteran affairs or commissions of veterans, and they do the same sorts of things that our um, commission has been doing, which is supporting events in the community, getting resources out there, and really working to support and promote, um, you know, the issues and the well-being of the veterans in the community. Um, just a couple of things from from what I hear I agree on what I heard from the Commission in terms of flexibility um, I, I did see because I looked up what the makeup and how many members some of these other cities have to see what is out there and what is working um, their commissions were really between you know seven nine um, I'm not a, a fan of always huge commissions. Sometimes you can have death by committee when there's so many people in, involved, but certainly don't want to exclude anybody that has been working hard. Um, so over time, um, you know, if if reducing the number as we move forward works, um, that works as well. I did see on some of the commissions, they did reserve a certain number of seats, just like we have done on our agriculture and historical preservation committee um, for agriculture seats, that there are a number of seats reserved just for veterans. So while we're flexible, we want to make sure that there are some seats. For instance, Long Beach, they have a committee of nine. Four of those seats must be veterans. Um, so I would um, support that, that we have a number of seats that must be, and then there's maybe some prioritizing, right, of like the student, the priority would go to someone if they applied from JROTC, right, or another organization like that. Um, and then, yeah, um, I think that all the bones are there, the pieces are there in that policy piece, and I think what we're gonna do is just really take that, um, and then as time goes by, fine tune and tweak, the commission will work as they have been giving um, you know, as all our adv advisory commissions do, giving advice to the council and their feedback to the council so that as issues come up and things are arise, then um, that is taken into account. There's a voice for veterans in the community. Thank you. Council Member Newton. Lori, it, just some of these, uh, uh, like on the policy paper, um, where it says like executive committee um, any changes to this policy paper must be approved by the uh, veterans committee by vote um, staff is going to be going through this and yeah I mean that obviously looks like a change 
coming. I would agree. I think we would have to let the new commission kind of work through and take what their operating norms want to be. Like, for example, they've gotten here how they want to operate a docent program. That's great. They can just kind of turn that into an outline. It's a little less of a governance document and more of maybe a norms for function of the commission. And that's great. I, I, we definitely, I think we want to empower commissions to have ownership of their work as long as they're operating under the umbrella of the city. So to Councilmember Abash's point, there's there's financial resources here that need to be appropriately documented and distributed. Not that anything's been inappropriate. It hasn't been. It's been perfectly fine. But as some of the members even pointed out at our meeting, that kind of check and balance is good. It's really healthy. So this, likewise, I would say that. Their general ways they like to operate, I think, likely continue very similar if not the same to where it is today but we'll need to dig into a little bit of this because again it does fall under the purview of the city so there needs they're not an independent commission right now with regard to a nonprofit, if there's a nonprofit formed in support of the memorial which is wonderful that will have its own governing body its own you know volunteers that volunteer to keep its books it won't meet in city hall and it's completely separate that can definitely have its own norms and operating but in the end that nonprofit's going to want to make donations to the city for the council to appropriate for improvements and great new amenities at the memorial so that is definitely more separate a commission truly is an arm of the city of the body and has to function under the purview of the council okay well i appreciate your your comment that because i'd like this committee or commission to have their own ownership of it uh, to me that's very important with our veterans and kevin um, you'll never know how much I appreciate all the work and your passion and what you've done over the years for our veterans and our veterans, uh, memorial. All right. Uh, I would just, uh, agree with the comments, uh, that were made by my colleagues up here and I'm in favor of leaving the size right now because again, it's been said a couple of times, there's uh, a lot of volunteers that have put in a lot of time and, and I would speak to the fact that there are so many events held at that memorial throughout the year and it's a lot of work and it takes a lot of hands to get those things done. Uh, and so leaving the size uh, as it is at this time, I think would be very, very important. And I, and I have observed like everybody kind of has their niche when we're doing those events up there. And uh, so everybody is certainly a valuable part of that team. Uh, and I think, you know, like everybody else has commented, the bones are there. So I would be fine with staff going ahead and, and bringing forth an ordinance for the council to review. So I will make one last observation just so we're totally clear as you know when the memorial was approved and when the gold star family uh, memorial was approved this is one of the most powerful lobbying groups literally in the city of norco and what we're actually doing we're actually elevating that that advocacy and it's something truthfully that, that i think is great because i'm you remember greg when we approved the memorial we had out those people in the corner and they were like shriveled bacon when every veteran turned wanted to know who wanted not to build the memorial. <laughs> so we're actually giving the veterans much, much, or we're elevating the power that they have. And I think it's a good thing. All right. So since this is asking uh, for just some uh, direction and guidance, we're good right we don't need to. all right perfect moving on to item 5b which is the landscape maintenance districts proposition 218 status update and consideration of next steps our, our facilities and maintenance director Ms. hamilton have to speak right into it amanda it's kind of hinky Oh, did you hear me off? Can you hear me now? Okay, good. Good evening, Mayor and City Council. Tonight I'm going to give you um, an update on uh, the Proposition 218 hearings for our LMDs, uh, predominantly LMDs 1, 2, and 3. So landscape maintenance districts are used by cities to ensure that a new development is self-funded. This includes landscape, lighting, parks, or anything that relates to um, the development itself. Uh, rates in LMDs are adjusted by the CPI annually. 
And if we need to go over that CPI amount to adjust the budget, um, if, if we're in a deficit, that's when we go into the Prop 218 process with the mail ballot. Currently in the city of Norco, we have five LMDs. Um, these LMDs were uh, formed uh, in the, uh, from the late 90s to the early 2000s. Um, all of these districts were all of these districts were approved with the city council knowing that they would be self-funded for the landscape improvements associated with the developments. This last year, when we brought you the LMD budgets, uh, uh, we noted that in LMDs one, two, and three, there were deficits, or they were in a position where they were so uh, they were funded so uh, lowly that we would need to go into Prop 218 hearings this next year. Uh, I do have an updated current budget summary for you. Um, in LMD one, we we had a fund balance this last year of seven hundred and thirty-five dollars, so we were in the black. Now, when we have uh, we have revenues of eleven thousand six hundred. 70, but we also have O&M budgets of 15300 So this leaves us in the red uh, with a deficit of $2,895. When we go and we look at LMD2, we started off in the red um, with a, a deficit of $756. Um, looking at the revenues and then looking at the O&M budgets, we're back in a deficit of $2,756. In LMD3, we started off in the black, but when we look at the revenues uh, up against the O&M budget, we are, we are in a deficit of $10,278. So anytime we need to adjust um, the rates for the annual assessment and it goes over the CPI amount, this is when we have to do the Prop 218 hearing. Um, the assessment engineer along with staff, uh, we've come up with optimal cost scenarios for these three districts, and I'm gonna go over those options now. LMD1 is Beezer. This is comprised of 67 parcels. The maintenance for this, for this district is along River Road. Um, our recommendations for this LMD is no action. Um, what we're recommending is basically for staff to continue to evaluate the budget options and possibly reorganize this district with the proposed Dilopi project. Uh, when we also say no action, what we will do is do the annual assessment based on CPI like we do um, every year for the LMDs. The next LMD is Western Pacific. This is comprised of 217 parcels. This area is around uh, Hidden Valley Parkway and Norco Drive, Norco Hills Drive. So the options that we have is option number one, which is no action. We can just um, increase this annually by the CPI. Option two is an 8% increase. Now what this would do was would cover the O&M costs for the maintenance of uh, the district, and it would also include uh, fence replacement in a 20 year cycle. Option three is a 16% increase that would cover our O&M cost. Uh, it would also have fence replacement and it would allow for a 20% um, reserve. Staff, uh, along with the assessment engineer, recommends option three in order to give us enough coverage to meet the O&M cost, replace the fencing that is in need of repair, and also keep that reserve. Here you'll see um, the broken fencing in LMD2, along with park areas that are in need of improvements. LMT3 is a syntax track. This is comprised of 82 parcels. This, um, this district sits right next to LMD2 and LMD4. The options for LMD3 are no action, assess it annually by the CPI. Option two is 11% increase just to cover operations and maintenance. 
Option three is a 19% increase to cover our operations and maintenance and also include fence replacement. That's recommendation is option three. We, uh, this will not include a reserve, but it will give us, uh, we will have that coverage of operation maintenance and fence replacement on a 20 year cycle. In these pictures, you'll see uh, we still have that old um, wooden fence, um, and we also have turf area maintenance that is on the exterior and the interior of the district. So just going back um, as a summary of staff recommendations for the LMDs, LMD1, um, we just want to uh, increase that by the CPI, the annual assessment by the CPI. Uh, LMD2 would initiate the Prop 218 process for an assessment of 16%. LMD3 would also initiate the Prop 218 process for an increase of 19%. With the direction of City Council tonight, if you do approve the Prop 218 process for LMDs 1, 2, and 3, we would go ahead and RKA would send out the letters and ballots on April 14th. We then would have um, an informational meeting uh, with the public on April 29th. That would be a Saturday. We would have it in the morning. Um, then we would have uh, Council set the public hearing on April 19th. We would have another informational meeting on May 10th. And that would be in the evening, on the weekday. If people are out of work, they can come and, and we can give them as much information and ask um, and answer any questions that they might have. On June 7th, uh, we would receive the public ballots. And that night at City Council, we would open them and um, do our count of the ballots. And I am available for any questions that you may have. Thank you. Uh... Hamilton for your report. We'll go ahead and start with uh, Council Member Newton. Do you have any questions of staff? Um, LMD no number one, um, that's in a, in a deficit right now, but um, your re recommendation is being based on uh, with the development of a future project in large LMD and, and I would agree with that that would be the smart move to do in the future but uh, the reality is that that development probably won't take place and an LMD LMD being up and running for three years um, why should we backfill that amount and carry that for the next let's say three years till that development comes online I think it's, I mean, it's interesting because we, we do think it's going to be coming online and um, we're also looking at a CPI this year of 7.3%. Um, we feel that it's just, if we're going to go through this process, let's do it right. Let's build for the future. Let's build in more reserves and um, see how that works out. I think it would be better for the residents if we do wait and see how we can develop that LMD into something bigger. Can I? May I add, Mayor? Sure. I would add also that um, the CPI being what it is this year, that gap will close naturally just by that by that revenue growing slightly faster than our expenditures. So that's one. But also the dollars are just so small. I would not recommend actually we backfill at all. I would carry that negative fund balance okay. and let that sit, let that ride and look to carry, pick it up, but not let it grow by the combination of revenues and then trying to trim where we can on the expenditure side. So it just feels like it would be a better fix for the neighbors and if we're able to do it like another zone in the district and add those units now i'm with you that if we can't let this go on if that development if we're three years from now and that development doesn't look like it's got legs i would say but for sure then we're, we need to consider what the neighbors there want to do and really these these elections are all about what the neighbors would like to do for their neighborhoods if, if they, would they like us to in, uh, increase their assessments and continue to see those improvements um, maintained at, a, at a, what we hope will be a narco premier community level or would they prefer not and then we're going to do our best we can with the money we have but it's not fair for the rest of Norco to subsidize what was meant to be their their self-sufficient place and that is somewhat of the discussions we've had in the past that um, especially with a couple of the other LMDs we can't keep 
carrying that load. That's correct. And, and again, that's why they were formed to begin with, just like development impact fees, right? Mm-hmm. Development impact fees are charged, again, to make sure that the residents who are here already and the infrastructure that supports them is not taxed or burdened by new, overloaded or burdened by new people. New people paying those development impact fees fund, essentially pay their own way with regard to parks, streets, water, sewer, infrastructure, and so forth. So very similarly, that cities formed these districts through the years so that those developments pay their own way. So it, it's appropriate. And I know it's a difficult conversation to have sometimes with those neighbors, but I always, I'm fond of telling the staff, we also have to think of the other 6,800 properties in town and those neighbors where it's not fair to divert funds from police and fire and parks and seniors and things that they value to fund in these existing developments. So. I think we're on the right track. We just need to have those, continue to have those conversations with the residents. Thank you. Thank you, Amanda. Council Member Altman. Council Member Bash. I have a few questions then, Amanda. Uh, you talked about the timeline for uh, the potential with the 218 hearings. How are residents going to be informed of those uh, meetings other than a letter? Um, what we're going to do is, um, so RKA is going to send out the letter with the ballots, but before every informational meeting, we're, the staff, we're going to be sending out um, a flyer to them, letting them know that that's coming up. We'll send out two different flyers for that for those meetings. And will those flyers be in envelopes or are we doing postcards? It's going to be in an envelope. That's the plan, but we could do postcards. Okay, well... And I get that, but I'm asking the questions because I'm tired of having meetings with two people showing up and then having a Prop 218 hearing fail because we didn't do the work on the front end. Yeah, Mayor, that's a point well taken. I And I've, I've been involved in these public information efforts in districts just like this. So typically what we would, I would want to see us do is kind of a multi-factor. I do like a big color postcard. I do find though that also virtual engagement is really helpful for people these days. A lot of people won't come to a meeting. So a combination of virtual and person can actually be really helpful. If you do a Zoom at 7.30 at night, you'll get people that will not come out on a Saturday morning because they got their kids in baseball and et cetera. So I think a combination of those things that we'll use our social media. So public information is very appropriate. We have to be careful and thoughtful that we're within the confines of the law and truly being informational and not advocational one way or another. Um, but it is essential that we do it. We just haven't gotten that far. Okay. Um, I just want to hear that we're going to do more than just a letter in a city envelope that doesn't get opened. Okay. Yes, that's ma'am. been previous practice so no that's our plan our okay. plan is to um, make some nice flyers postcards and, and get them out before these meetings so that they are very well aware that we're going to have these meetings okay perfect any other questions of staff okay so then I'm going to go ahead and open public comment at this time are there any Thank cards you. I do have cards first one Matt Jefferson First, Mayor of Grandmire, County staff. Uh, it's been about six months since I was here last time, so I thought I'd come and speak on behalf of all LMD. Um, this particular situation has been kind of unique because I'm an LMD5, and this is not my LMD district that I'm concerned about making a public comment. But I think generally we have an interesting opportunity. Uh, Measure R funds are significantly higher than expected. Uh, we expended over, I think, one year, $7 million. And then the last year was over 12 and a half million. And I think those expenditures have benefited the entire city. And I'd like to take a step back and just say, a lot of this, according to the report, has to do with fencing degradation. There are shared fencing areas that enhance and contribute to the value and look of the entire community. While most of these LMDs also have a CFD. For people that don't know, that's a common funding district and that has paid for the police and the fire and the expansion of civil, you know, other uh, public utility works during that time. The LMD, obviously, the intent and the purpose of the fencing was something I discussed last time. On November 30th, a sign went up along California near my uh, LMD that said Measure R funds were being used. 375 feet, linear feet of, of fencing on vinyl was done on California, but no other part of my LMD has been done. And what I'd like to propose is have the city council and staff and city manager take a real hard look at how we use Measure R funds 
in shared ingress and egress streets like Fifth and California. I'm not talking about the rest of my LMD. I'm not talking about internal streets in LMD one through three. But if we start to look at how this beautifies the city and the experience of shared streets, whether that be on Norco Drive or whether that be on River Road, I think that that opportunity is. And when I met with um, the uh, city staff after my meeting here last time, I suggested that we do a 2x annual report and review of LMD funds so that the information is timely because obviously budgets have changed, costs have gone up, and I think the opportunity for us to really have a serious conversation and say what's good for the LMD but what's good for the overall city. I'm not concerned about my LMD myself and I know Ted and God rest his soul and thank you again for all the efforts that the city and the staff made uh, during the memorial but I would just like to share because I was known as LMD5 guy, I'm LMD everyone guy tonight. And I'd like to see us think about the city and the beautification of those shared transit areas where people that might not live here, but they see a nice vinyl fence. That might be part of the property that's LMD, and I think we should use Measure R funds for that. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, next person, Jody Weber, please. Good evening, council staff. Um, I'll follow on the heels of LMD everybody guy. I am LMD woman uh, this evening. Um, I've been before you for the last 13 years on this LMD issue. I personally reside in LMD four. And so I would like to address um, a couple of issues. Um, first of all, this is not the first 218 hearing we've had in the city. I actually do support uh, the city manager's contention that I pay my LMD uh, fees, I pay my LMD taxes, I pay my uh, community Melarus taxes as well. What I don't appreciate is that you have citizens in this community that are now subsidizing another person's LMD. When they purchased their homes, they were well aware of their responsibilities to pay for that LMD. They were also well aware of the fact that those fees and taxes would increase based on the CPI. Um, so the fact that we are very conscientious about the, about the fact of everybody being concerned about having taxes raised we also have to balance that against some of the savings that they actually probably have in their own households right now with probably working from home, no longer having taxes or gas issues and whatnot. So keep that in mind. And also we've not done a 218 hearing because you also are concerned about the cost of doing a 218 hearing and it not really achieving its purpose and function because I think Mayor Grunmeyer you made a very important point which is not sufficient communication to the citizens and this is another factor these citizens that are living in these districts have complained about the fact that they don't have fencing they don't have water to their rosemary they have a number of complaints and yet they don't recognize that they took on the responsibility when they purchased the home to actually fulfill the responsibility that is due one other point i do want wish to make um for staff's purposes and i will raise this time and time again this is not a savings account okay so when staff speaks of a reserve that is not what this LMD is. You cannot save funds as a reserve. It is taxing for the cost of each parcel and the individuals who own it. Had I lived here prior to you creating this reserve for the drains that we have in LMD4, that would have never occurred. The Streets and Lighting Code actually provides for special assessments for those things. Now, I recognize you want to create a reserve for fencing, but I will be back before you again to say I will still speak out on behalf of everyone in the LMD to make sure that this reserve doesn't exist because that's not what the purpose of an LMD is for. Thank you. Thank you. I have one more. Jeff Kayan. Good evening, Council. I am 
LMD guy one. I'm in the Beezer track, Revington Estates. I certainly would not want to pay for the prices that they pay an LMD for, so I'm not necessarily complaining about the amount we pay because it's not so much the amount. The issue was if we add the new Dilopi property and they add us into, we've got 67 houses, the parcel map that I saw maybe six years ago, they were looking at 32 to 34 homes. I'm definitely going to be going to the meeting tomorrow night to see what the new proposal is because I, I know things have changed. But if we're still in the 30 or 40 new homes added to or whatever the number is, the, the I guess the question, and I'll have to probably come back in the future once we see what's going to happen, but what our LMD pays for is just that little strip of of landscaping on River Road that you can see from the Stater Brothers. It's, I would say it's not even in our neighborhood, it's on the outside edge. Okay, it makes our entrance to our neighborhood look nice, but it's not actually in the neighborhood. So the question would be, what kind of LMD enhancements would the new Dilopi people get? Because for our money, we're all paying for just this little strip on the outside. If all they get is a little strip on the outside, then they probably would pay something commensurate. I don't know that it would be fair to give them some grand, super fancy entrance, and then by folding it into us, we now have to pay for their neighborhood to look fancy versus the 23 years that we've been paying just for that little strip that we've got on river. I don't know if that makes sense, but you see what I'm saying? So I guess it depends on what, what LMD accessories they're going to get and what they're going to be charged for before I would say let's just wrap them into ours just because they happen to be next door. If they get something extravagant, maybe they become LMD6. I don't know. But just food for thought. Thank you. No more cards. All right, thank you. We'll bring it back to council for discussion and action. Council Member Bash? A couple of things. Um, it's, it's so ironic because um, I remember when this development happened and a lot of promises were made. For example, you'd never see any homes from the corner of 6th and Hamner. Think about that. This room was packed, people were standing outside and they showed these big renderings. And they said, don't worry, Norco will not have to pay for this. And one of the questions raised that night was, well, when they don't want to vote in the taxes anymore, what happens? And so we as a council, as the costs escalated, so for example, uh, we took on Norco Drive. Are we still doing that? Are we still taking on that landscaping and all that stuff? We're still doing that as a city. So that huge chunk is now the responsibility of the city. River Road, didn't we, isn't that part of the LMD that, LMD1? Didn't we just completely redo that road with Measure R funds? So is that, that's not in front of LMD1, that's just, um, we've tried to do the entrances. Um, LMD2, uh, I walked the streets and lost by what, three votes? because we couldn't get the word out, but we really tried to help them and we started picking up costs and we made them a great deal. And Robin may remember when a lady came in and was a lawyer and she said, you know what, we didn't vote for this and it's not right that you fixed it all up. So we were like, well, I'm not gonna do that anymore. So I have to tell you, I like your philosophy because the reality is those homes never would have been built had that agreement not been made, that those homes being built was the single most, the biggest change to this community in its entire history. It completely changed the direction of Norco. And now, you know, you talk to the people, the, the staff that was responsible for it, they kind of laugh and say, yeah, it was just too big for us. I mean, what was built was not what was promised, period. And I have an, I do have a question. So in terms of the, the costs, isn't, isn't the, the bond 
Chad that goes 30 years isn't that for the infrastructure that's there. It's not for police and fire, right? Um, we all pretty much throughout the entire city, I don't want to correct anybody because I like the comments of the person that said that, but we all pay that equal amount. Um, And one of the problems we have is because they voted down the last one, their fencing and stuff doesn't look so great. Their, their the trees and things don't look so great. But we got, literally, it was that lady that changed everything. It was sort of like, well, I guess you're right. But we made them such a great deal, and it got voted down. So... And I know there's a lot of people up there that feel, well, we can use Measure R funds. I mean, how come they get Measure R funds and we're not getting this? We're not... The point is, is that the entire development occurred because Norco knew they couldn't afford it. And a lot, I know most of those people are gone maybe. I mean, I'm here, Greg is here, Robin's here. But there were very serious pro pro promises made. And so I, but I also like the comments about the entrances. I do think that there's some merit to that, that we look at some of the entrances and we make sure it's dolled up. But I don't know, I kind of get frustrated with social media because I don't think people realize we're in the middle of the largest renovation of the city of Norco from underground up than in our entire history, literally. I mean, I was talking about Second and Hamner this morning when it used to be a lake. And I mean, Headley Avenue was a lake to all the storm drains. I mean, Greg remembers Crestview. I drove Crestview through this rain. It's fabulous what's happened there. There's almost no flooding. There's no flooding at all. And I can remember when it was a river. So I'm gonna support the uh, recommendation of the staff. And um, again, if it'll help, I'll walk, I'll walk up there and knock on doors, give me, give me the talking points that we should try to adhere to. But I think that that was the promise. And even though it's 20 years old, I think we need to just be kind of hardcore about it and do it that way. Anyway, thank you. Council Member Alleman. Amanda, um, you know, said in regards to LMD1, wanting to make sure that uh, we do this right. And so I talked to our city manager about my concerns on the timing, right? It's next month. Um, and, and to echo the concerns of Mayor Grunmeyer about the outreach and is that enough time to to get the education out there um, I think all of us you know would, would want to go through a 218 process if we were sure that we could get all the information out there that people need to make a good decision for them right because it's their district it's their property and these are improvements that are happening specific to their areas that are not in other neighborhoods of Norco um, that that other houses just they don't have right it's just their property it's a street and it's the horse trail that that they maintain or a back trail or they might even have fencing where they are um so that being said norco is also you know um what our city manager mentioned it, it, a premier equestrian community right we're no longer just kind of in the middle of nowhere um and it's 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 expensive to live here now. Um, and I think we are a premier community with our large lots and our and our agricultural lifestyle. And so I, I wanted to hear really on this what my what my colleagues felt um, in terms of for me, what's gonna be the most most successful option? That's that's the best option. How can we get the best information out there in a timely manner so that we just can make sure that you know, whatever the result is, that it's it's the result of people knowing the information and making the best decision. And if it doesn't go through, that we're not going to be able to keep up the level of services that are there, that that the city cannot keep backfilling um, these extra amenities that are present in these in these neighborhoods. And, um, you know, for people who bought a, bought a property with an LMD and didn't really understand it, it sucks, you know, but um, that's the way that those were set up. And, um, you know, we can't just keep filling in, filling in these other pieces with the 
with the general fund. So I hear from um, Council Member Bash, you know, option three, when I was having a, a separate conversation before this meeting with city manager, um, you know, maybe two, somewhere in the middle. Um, I mean, really for me, there's not that big of a difference from option two to three on LMD two. Um, you know, it's $60 a year. That's a very minimal increase per month. It's about a hundred dollars difference on, on LMD three. So my interest really is hearing what my other, other colleagues have to say and, and what they think is the best course of action so we can find consensus. And then to give our whole hearts, wholehearted support to the staff on what they need to make this effort successful. Council member Newton. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, Amanda? On um, LMD1, what Mr. Cahan had brought up was, um, don't we maintain the trails? No. The interior of the district. We don't maintain the trails, we don't maintain the white vinyl fencing, and we do not maintain Sundance Park as part of the district. Yeah. In LMD one. We maintain that separately, but not as part of the as part of the district. Okay. So that's just coming out of general fund. Correct. And all we maintain is just that little bit from Corydon along river yeah. to their entrance. Well, and and I think this will be a conversation in the future that With a, the potential of a future development, I would think that um, that would be under an LMD, and that would also pick up maintenance of trails and whatever amenities are within that development. Well, that sure would be a burden on LMD number one to join those two. Or, I mean, are we going to look at, and, and it's just a projection, yeah. you know, that. Um, I don't know if I'm that you know, trying to look in the future and say, you know, General Fund will maintain the, the the trails of a new development when we could burden that with an LMD. So, um, Councilmember, I'm always going to advocate that new development absorb the costs for its public improvements. So, yes, right. whether it's an right. HOA or an LMD or a, a CFD for for maintenance, mm -hmm. whatever the mechanism, um, our General Fund just doesn't have the bandwidth to take right, on that right so the mechanism is 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 up in the air but with regard to the level of improvements let's say the Delapi development goes in and has a higher level of improvements mm -hmm. there's an opportunity to, develop, to have a second zone of lmd1 so within an lmd you can have zones of benefit with different rates of assessment okay but where you get benefit is that when our contractor goes out and when you're bidding that area in a larger amount there's economy of scale sure so so they may have separate rates but for us to go out to contractor z and say hey here's the improvements you roll out your one truck with your one trailer and your mowers and your etc cetera, etc cetera, you get economies of scale right the uh, you know look uh, Armchair quarterbacking, the decision to just do that little frontage on river as an LMD was really not a great one, right? right. Armchair quarterbacking right. Um, in hindsight, because you just don't get any economies of scale to have just a contractor go roll out there for that one little line. I mean, it's very inefficient. So that would be how LMD1 could be helped. Mm -hmm. Creating zone two, again, even if it has more improvements, even if we make it in maintain interior trails and so forth, they may have a different rate. But both benefit from grouping together and getting some bang for their buck. I, and, and I appreciate that, Lori. It's just a concern I have, you know, in, in the future with that development. But then I look at just that little bit on River Road, and they're spending fifteen thousand dollars to <clears throat> what maintenance? You know, it's I don't know. It just seems kind of jacked up to me. Um, so yeah, this is operations, maintenance, admin, time. Um, so it's, um, it's everything. I, I, yeah, I know the story. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Amanda. Mm -hmm. um, Colin, I guess I'll direct this question to you. And it's, um, I appreciate what Jody says. And I don't want this to sound wrong, but welcome to the LMD wars because what we've learned over the years with Jody and the discussions that she had with your partner, Harper, um, 
looking forward to it. Um, <laughs> What Ms. Weber brought up about the reserves um, in, in these numbers, if, if we're not allowed to carry a reserve, um, I mean, it's a different opinion here, so I, I don't want to drag it out at this time, but. I, you can't have a reserve to replace facilities down the road. You don't have to constantly run on, on, a, on a zero budget. It's, it's not a savings account. It's in many Prop 218. Uh, funds, you do carry a certain amount of overage for when you have to replace a large facility. So I don't necessarily see it as a savings account. I think you can carry a little bit over. It's common. So uh, a little bit of a, a disagreement with the nomenclature, but I think I, I, I look forward to discussing it with Ms. Weber, but I think we're going to agree. Um, well, okay. maybe. <laughs> <laughs> Right. I'll echo um, Collins I, respectfully. Like I appreciate, right. but it, there's just it's very common and it's necessary because you landscaping improvements have a life, playgrounds have a life. Right. We do not have the authority under to just impose an assessment that that might have been true prior to the prop, the passage of Prop 218 in 1986. I'm not sure, but now we definitely don't. Any kind of sizable assessment increase would require voter approval. So it's very commonplace for districts to carry. Op capital reserves and also cash operating reserves because tax payments come in twice a year. They come in in the fall. There's often a cash deficit in the spring. So often you'll see cities with a reserve policy that has capital reserves and also operating reserves for cash flow for their special districts. Now we don't have that here and I'm not advocating for it, but to the point though that it is customary, commonplace and actually a best practice to have some level of reserve, but absolutely true that it is not a savings account. You can't have five times the amount of the budget. I mean, that would that would be definitely excessive, and we'd be walking into strange territory if that occurred. So I absolutely agree with um, our resident that that's not appropriate. We're Certainly, and we're not advocating for that at all, right? Just some level of reserve to replace what's coming down the line. Thank you both. Thank you, Mayor. So I just have some general comments. Um, LMDs are not my favorite thing. There's, I've been told that if they're set up correctly, they work. And unfortunately, in my time on council, it hasn't been the case. So um, I think when we did our last 218 hearing, it really was a lack of outreach. It was a lack of education of our residents. And we were so close to getting it to pass. And that's an incredibly frustrating place to be as a council member. Uh, and I certainly don't want to walk into this process um, naive or um, not knowing that what we did last time was completely inadequate and insufficient. So with that being said, you know, as I'm looking at the numbers and we talk about an 8% increase and we talk about a 16% increase, absolutely, if I hear it's a 16% increase, I, as a taxpayer, am going to be probably slightly irritated. But when we look at the numbers, uh, just on, for example, I just did LMD2 just for the heck of it, the 8% increase results in approximately $5.25 per month. You go to the 16% increase, it results in $10.75 per month. If I'm a resident and I'm going to go to a website and I'm going to get educated, if I'm going to say I can have this for $5 a month or I can have this for $10 a month, and it's justified, I'm probably going to say, you know what, I can afford an additional $10 a month for my neighborhood to have X, Y, and Z. But the fact of the matter is, we don't do that. And so what I would like to advocate for is that we have a section on the website that clearly states with like a Canva, simple graphics, bullet points, here's what an LMD is for, here is what you pay, here is what you get. If you pick this option, you're going to get this. If you pick this option, you're going to get that. And break it down. Don't tell me 8%. Don't tell me 16%. Give me the dollar amounts in terms of what I think about when I'm paying my bills on a monthly basis. Um, and I know, again, that's going to take staff time uh, to do that. And I like the idea of the multifaceted outreach. Uh, but something that caught my eye in Corona last week was they had uh, just the little signs, the little plastic ones on the little forks, and it said the grass is greener on the other side. And it was a little thing to catch your eye, and it's their LMD outreach, and it had a cute, 
you know, a QR code and a website so people could go there and find out what that was all about. And I thought, how interesting when you're sitting at the stoplight, oh my goodness, this is in the LMD, this is not. I can scan it with my phone real quick and then go to a website where we have all of this broken down in plain English, easy to read, easy to understand, and able to make an educated decision as a member of that LMD. So if, you know, I can, we can get the commitment that we're really going to do education about LMDs, that we're really going to do the outreach, um, I would be in favor of going for the option three, um, but like Catherine said, do we have the time or what does the timeline? Can we do it by a vote in June? I think so, but it's gonna be work on the part of staff uh, to get that done and get that outreach done. Uh, I'm not interested in, in going through kind of like a charade 218 hearing and sitting here watching those ballots being opened to just be defeated again. So that's my two cents on that. So, uh, Mayor, if I may. Yes. I, I think that um, uh, staff would absolutely support the ability to give a really great public information effort. Um, I love the idea of doing um, some informative website information. And we definitely can, on a website, talk about the assessment rate in light of monthly monthly costs on a website um, but on a ballot we're not able to do that so but we can do that kind of information i love i've done the lawn signs before it's again in the informational with a qr i love that um, but frankly with this timeline that we're going to be challenged because the ballots will have to go out in order to be able to and we're backing up from the um the county tax roll deadlines right to get to this june hearing um so we just i think we're going to be really challenged to do what the kind of effective outreach you're advocating for on this timeline so it may be better to do it next year and get that authorization if you're so inclined today so we can actually build that into our work plan and not be talking about this in March of next year, but be talking about it in January so that we can have a better timeline. The other option is we don't have to try to make this tax roll. We could roll this out and go out to a ballot in November, but it just won't be in time for this budget. It would be next year. It would hit next year's tax roll. So that's another option for you to consider um, because, again, I'm just thinking we have given our the size of our crew, we just don't. I don't know that we have the ability to do what I hear you would like us to do. And I agree that would be really what we, we should do. Um, I just don't know if we can do that in the next 30 days or 28 days actually before the ballots go out. Any comments from colleagues? Well, in that case, then I would be in favor of postponing it, whether it's a fall or a next year. I feel like if we're going to, if we're going to do it wrong, we're going to have to do it again anyways. So if we're going to do it right, let's do it right. Um, um, which was to, to Amanda's point with the first LMD. Um, you know, as much as we want to make it work, we have to look at the data, we have to look at the facts, the work plan, our staff, and if it's just not gonna work, then then that's the, that's the hard decision, right? Even though that's not the outcome that we would prefer for our neighborhoods or, or our residents. Other comments? I agree with that. Yeah, and, and I'm gonna say I'm gonna agree too, because again, sitting up here and having a 218, fail by like just two or three votes. It was it's, horrible. It, it's absolutely horrible. We're pissed off at you. Yeah, and it's it's like... insane. And I think again, we have known that we were going to have to do a 218 hearing. We've all known that we were going to have to do a 218 hearing. So to try and roll it out in a month, um, I, I just don't, I don't see it being successful because we're not giving time to, to make it work. So if you know i'm of the same opinion if we need to um hold it and do it right then that's what we need to do is there consensus from uh, is that a motion well i think we're just or giving uh just give you direction recommendation to staff on this one i support that recommendation okay Everybody good? Yeah, Mayor, I would just ask for some feedback on what council might feel might be the appropriate or the best timing for bringing, if we doing an election. I mean, what's your, what are, you, what are your thoughts about well, you're that? You're the expert. Um, 
which season is the best? <laughs> yeah, right? So I would say, um, how about this? How about we kind of get your consensus that we've got your consensus that we are not going to go this moment. So let us strategize as a team and come back at a future meeting with a recommendation. How about that? I'd like to talk to our team and get some feedback from them. Okay. My only concern on that is take your time to do it right. That we don't need the crisis management. Agreed. Yeah. Agreed. I'm going to say looking at our workflow too, when is a time that, that makes sense in terms of the resources that we have that are able to be Right. Okay. Just off tentatively, I'm thinking that something that we would – begin an, a public information effort, say in June or July, and aim for like a ballot schedule in the fall. Just kind of thinking out loud about it. Because then what that does is if, if we, despite this really kind of great effort we make, if we can't get uh, residents aren't interested, then we can make plans for how we ramp back the maintenance levels to within our mean, living within our means, and we roll it into the next budget. So that gives us time to do that, as opposed to rushing to do that, so. But I want to talk to the team. I want to think about it. Um, mull it over a little. All right, perfect. Thank you. So we are going to go on to uh, item 5C, which is the discussion and taking possible action concerning a city council uh, vacancy. And that will that report is going to be given by our city manager. Question. We need a break for a minute. No, you said 5C. Yeah. Oh, do you want to do 5C on RTRP really quick? California strategies. On my agendas, both of them. Oh, well, on the printed agenda, it's the, um, and on the one on our uh, iPad is a city council vacancy with 5D being the strategies. Yeah, when the printout went, it went with the it wrong wrong and it was already gone out and, and it so was I updated made the correction. right we can do either mayor item you'd like to do mayor whichever you'd like to do you want to do five okay did you anybody need a break or are you good um, yeah okay let's go ahead and take a five minute break and when we reconvene uh we'll just go ahead and follow the order of the agenda that i have printed which is 5c uh city council vacancy great so five minute break please
go with the agenda that I have on the iPad and the printed one, which will be 5C discussion and take possible action concerning city council vacancy. And the report will be from our city manager. Thank you, Mayor. So um, this is a discuss and take possible action item concerning the city council vacancy. And the recommendation is for you to discuss your options and preferences with regard to filling the vacancy. So obviously with the passing of Mayor Pro Tem Hoffman, um, we have an existing council vacancy that exists for the remainder of his term, which would have expired November in 2024. Um, Council members in Norco are elected to staggered terms of four years. And as I mentioned, his term would be expiring November 24. So in, current, in accordance with government code section 36.512, within 60 days of the occurrence of a vacancy, the council must fill the council vacancy either by appointment or by calling a special election. So you have until April 22nd, 2023 to make this determination within that window. Um, it's staff's opinion that calling a special election is cost prohibitive. Um, and to avoid that unnecessary expense, most city councils do choose to appoint a successor to fill a vacancy. And that has been the tradition in the recent past here in Norco. When similar vacancies occurred under similar circumstances in 2008 and 2010, at both those times, appointments were made in lieu of calling for special elections in those situations. If a council chooses to fill the vacancy by appointment and the vacancy occurs in the second half of the term of office, which is the case here, then the person appointed to fill the vacancy holds the, the holds office for the unexpired term of the inc former incumbent. So again, if once a, if you choose to go the route of an appointment, that person would hold office until November of 2024. It's recommended you discuss this and take action as appropriate. If you choose the vacant, to fill the vacancy by appointment, the next question is how to do that. Um, you can choose to appoint immediately or you can solicit applications. I know in the past, again, the immediate past, the councils have chosen to solicit applications for interested parties. Um, if you desire to solicit applications, staff can gather those applications and bring the matter back at the next council meeting. Probably the best one, you could wait till the 15th of April, though you still are within that 60 day window. So that's my report, Mayor. We're happy to answer any further questions. Thank you. So we'll take uh, council questions of staff. Councilmember Alleman, any questions? Councilman Bash, any questions? Councilmember Newton, Not any questions? Response. Okay. Uh, do we have any public comments? I do have one, Mike Williams. Okay, so no public comments. So I'll bring it back to uh, council for discussion and action. Anybody have? Any comments or Catherine? Sure, just to say, um, I understand our city manager's recommendation. This is what many cities do. It is quite costly to put on a special election. Um, so supportive of an appointment. Um, however, the appointment happens, just wanna make sure that it's open and transparent and that you know the community has a chance to weigh in and that anyone who is interested would have the opportunity to apply, whether we take applications and then appoint at the next meeting. In the past, I believe interviews were done. Um, we have some time, but um, that's just, uh, you know, so that people can put their interest forth, come forward, and then deliberate and appoint someone. So I have a clarifying question of uh, colleagues that have been on council longer than I uh, were. Can you explain the process for me under previous um, appointments or, or processes for that? Uh, when Hal Clark died, we interviewed uh, multiple people it came down to Dick McGregor and myself and because Dick had the experience and because Norco was just entering the two, 2008 downturn um, he, at that point he was the longest serving councilman in the history of the city um, I stepped back and he was appointed and then when Malcolm Miller passed away uh, that was for Hal Clark when Malcolm Miller passed away we held a uh, we had applications and uh, Councilman Newton was selected as the uh, appointee. Um, it's a, it's a double-edged sword. Those are very tumultuous times. Um, the difference between, in my opinion, those eras and this is we actually have a very cohesive council. And right now we're facing unprecedented uh, really unprecedented things from the state of California. And I'm not so, for me, I'm not so certain that, and I 
to uh, Councilwoman Alleman's point, opening it up and taking that time. I personally think at this point we might want to follow Eastvale's lead and look at somebody who has served before and fit them in because one of the considerations also before was that they were worried that you'd be setting somebody up for an unfair advantage in the next election. And the next election I anticipate is going to be extremely bloody um, with, with the passing of uh, Councilman Hoffman that's going to open a whole new seat. Um, and so my recommendation would be, I think, personally, um, I would go back to Berwyn Hanna and I would seek maybe to appoint him. In 2010, having lived through this, um, and it would, I mean, it was still turmoil that um, that's where we were pretty well bankrupt. I think you would agree to that, Kevin. And then right out of the gate was the the transition uh, from our fire department to go to Cal Fire. And I had three terms on the planning commission. I thought I was prepared. I knew where the restroom was, okay? And sitting here today, all I can tell you, there would have been such a value to have institutional knowledge and no matter what you think and how prepared you are, um, it's still a shock. And uh, so... Uh, I, I would, I don't mean to interrupt, but I totally, I was 12 years on commissions. Right. And I was shocked at what I didn't know. I mean, the bankruptcy, but just a ton of other things. And um, so I agree with you. Yeah. Um, other than that, Mayor, I'll leave it to you to Thank you. all my comments. So for me, uh, I concur with the comments of my colleagues. Um, at this point in time, we have so many projects and so many things going on that it would be my preference to put somebody in that knows the ropes, that knows um, folks, and can step in and not have a learning curve. And so I'll be completely transparent. My thought process was who is in this town right now that has served up here on this dais. And then in more recent history, has some of the knowledge of um, what we've been through in the past few years. And so I approached Berwyn and if Berwyn um, had told me, Robin, you're straight crazy, go fly a kite, then that would have been the end of it. Um, but I talked to him a couple of times and I also have in the back of my mind, who are we going to put in that position that would continue, um, carrying those flags that Ted carried and was passionate about those things that Ted was passionate about. Um, Berwyn has a long history with RTA and RCTC, uh, and established relationships. Uh, I can tell you from going to League of Cities and different events. Uh, Berwyn was Norco when he walked into the room, just period. That's the way it was. And all those relationships uh, are still there and can be easily picked up and carried. Um, and so at this time, I would like to make a motion that we appoint Berwyn Hanna to Ted's vacant seat. Second. So under discussion, um, I, I just want to preface my vote with the issue with the process and not the person. Um, Mr. Hanna is not here, don't believe. Um, he's not and you know in the past I've heard many times from my colleagues that we want people to be present to speak for themselves you know we want people to get involved we want people to be invested in our city and by putting somebody on without putting that on agenda or letting anyone to 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 weigh in um, the the process is the is the issue for me in this I understand that Berwyn is very involved that he has a lot of experience and that all those things bring a lot of value uh, to the table. Um, but given that, um, you know, I think process is really important and being fair is really important and being transparent is really important. And, um, for those reasons, um, you know, I take a little, I prickle a little bit about the appointment of somebody without, um, giving the public a chance to weigh in. Can I ask for clarification um, from the city attorney that uh, with this item being agendized that 
and taking public comment that should someone have an interest in this position or an interest in the process, they had their opportunity this evening to speak. That's correct, Mayor. And so what we're doing uh, this evening potentially uh, is within our purview to do so. That's correct. Okay, thank you. So uh, we have a motion and a second. Uh, yes, we do. Let's go ahead and vote. Uh, oh, I got one vote. Sorry, system must be slow. I'm not getting your vote. I vote yes. Okay. And Member Newton, somehow I did not get your vote either. Mr. Newton. It's it's not showing up, unfortunately. May I get your vote, sir? I would love your vote, sir. Thank you. Motion passed, 3-1. Thank you. Uh, we'll go on to item 5D, which is the consideration of a professional services agreement with California Strategies, and the report for this one will also come from our city manager. Thank you, Mayor. Just very briefly, you have before you an agreement with California Strategies to assist and help us with our efforts to pursue undergrounding of the Riverside Transportation and Reliability Project, RTRP, through Norco and Riverside. So um, we are hard at work um, with our subcommittee, Councilmember Bash, Councilmember Newton, at advocating for undergrounding of these high power transmission lines on giant towers through our eastern areas of Norco. So really, we need some professional assistance. This is a special specialty, a technical skill that we don't have in-house. Um, Steve Larson is a former executive director of the California Public Utilities Commission and has worked with Riverside previously on this project, so he has a lot of information experience. So we're recommending we retain his services for six months to really lead this effort, working alongside you, council members, and our team to advocate for the interests of Norco and really work with our partners in Riverside, but we're gonna advocate for Norco um, and, and continue to collaborate with them and what they decide to do will be what they decide to do, but we're hoping we're working together. So uh, recommending approval. All right, thank you. So we'll go to council uh, questions of staff. Council member Newton, any questions? I'm, uh, I'm gonna wait. Okay. Council member. I have some questions, oh. but. Okay. Council member Alleman. Council member Bash. All right, so then we will go ahead and move to public comment. Do we have any cards on this item? I do have a couple of cards. First one, Adam Saffenfield. And Mayor, if I may, while the commenter comes to the podium, you do have a letter of opposition on this item from Southern California Edison at your dais. Okay. Adam? Less than no. less. Okay. Uh, Randy Lewis? There we go. Good evening, my name's Randy, and uh, I appreciate all the work you guys do on all the city business. It's a whole lot of work, and I appreciate you guys take all the time to do that. Uh, as far as the towers, um, they're going to be horrific to look at those. I live right on the riverbed, and those things are going to be like 18 stories high with all the cables. And then when they come to where I live, they're going to shoot straight up to where my neighbor is up on the hill. So every time I come down my street, I'm going to look at this massive tower. And we've had the fire problems down there as well. So these towers could be a big fire hazard as well. We get 80 mile an hour winds through there quite a bit, 60 to 80 mile an hour winds. And uh, it's just very hazardous. So I'm for uh, hiring the advocates. I think it's a good use of the city money. I know it's going to cost a little bit, but. Uh, if they can find the money to do the undergrounding, um, I think that'd be the way to go. Thank you. No other cards. So we'll bring it back to council for discussion and action. Do you have your questions now? I'll try to get to it. Um, 
<laughs> I look at this, this. This is a David and Goliath battle that we have in front of us. Um, there's no doubt. Um, so this this letter from Edison. Um, and Kevin, I know that you know you can pound on it a little bit, but um, this is what I've always enjoyed about bullies. That um, let's start with the fear element, and then the money element, and just how bad this is, and um, it's always fun to stand up to them. You may you may get your butt kicked. And it, it happens, but um, it's worth the fight. Um, I think the comment th that they wrote in their letter was, um, you know, gi giving their reasons, but that um, I did not know that uh, Hidden Valley in the, in the riverbed was a undeveloped open space that is sparsely vegetated with low-lying sagebrush and is largely devoid of trees. Um, and then, of course, you know, where they address, like, social justice. And, um, it's just their standard excuse. And it, it, to me, it's, it's worth the challenge. Um, we're going to need the help. There's no guarantee we're going to win on this. But um, my question is, this letter... Um, can we get this out to our partners on the subcommittee um, before Monday so that um, that we do have some discussion about this also? Okay. And, Chad, you were copied on this also or not? You got it? Okay. Okay. That's all I have. Councilmember Alleman. No, just in response to the opposition letter that we got, um, you know, we answer to the residents and we support their requests and, and what they want for their neighborhoods. And th it is clear that they have sent us with a mandate to oppose RTRP and to we'll do our best to get it undergrounded. And that's exactly what we're going to do. Thank you. Councilmember Bash. Well, we've been fighting this for a long time, and the reality is, is it is a David and Goliath. I, that's a very good analogy. We, um, we've been shut out of this process for a decade. I mean, this PUC lost our paperwork. I mean, two or three times we kept trying to be a party to the action, and they'd lose our paperwork. Um, so then, you know, we'd go before the PUC, and... We'd have three minutes and you'd get there and say, oh, we're sorry, too many people talking, you get one minute. So you're like condensing this thing that you work with your attorney with, you know, for two, three hours. Um, the reality is they want to run it through one of the last wildlife areas, literally in the area. Uh, they want to run it through a low-income Hispanic neighborhood. And when this was approved, you nobody even thought of that kind of equity. Nobody even thought about those kind of things. And so um, now they do. And I just wish, I wish that Edison would reverse their decision. Um, I know they won't, but when you go to Riverside, this is a massively unpopular project. And what really upsets me is that the original route was up the 15 or up the 60 through the wood streets. How long do you, I mean, that's where all the, <laughs> the, <laughs> the rich white folks live. <laughs> I mean, I hate to say it any other way, but, you know, that's a historic area. And, uh, and I wouldn't like to see it run through there either. But I'm, I'm kind of, I was very, very proud of uh, every member of the city council. I was really proud of how Lori organized us. I was very proud how we went before the Riverside City Council, and I think that our plea is what turned them around. We changed this from a 3-4 vote um, to a 6-1 vote. And so I, I don't want to spend the money at all, but I don't see any way around it. I think that 10 years from now, we're going to go, if we can stop this and get it undergrounded, I think that 
our children and our grandchildren will thank us. This is one of the last areas. And in terms of their fire danger, um, one of the things that Riverside pointed out is they're afraid of having their power shut off or having a power outage. They've had one in 20 years. And it's because apparently a balloon hit one of their high transmission lines and, and shut it down. Uh, so I'm, I'm, and having had the fires and stuff, I, I just don't trust Edison that these things won't cause a fire. And then I guess to my other point, every time the wind comes, they're going to shut the power off. So it's like, why wouldn't you underground it? So I'm in favor of this, obviously. Again, I don't want to spend the money, but I, I also, it's kind of cool to play David once in a while. All right, I'll echo uh, the comments of my colleagues. And again, I don't know why you would fight for this long and this hard and then just tap out at the end. So uh, if we need to hire a consultant to help us with that fight, I'm certainly in favor of it. And then uh, I think in Norco, we have a history of um, winning battles that people said we would never win. So I hope this is another one that we'll be able to chalk up on that tally. So, so um, with that being said, I'll make a motion to approve uh, the agreement with the consultant and amend the 22-23 budget to appropriate the funds. Second. Give it to Greg. It's yours, Greg. Okay, go ahead and vote now, please. Yes. Thank you. Passed 4 0. So we took care of item number six earlier in the meeting, so we will go to item number seven. Uh, city staff. Chad looks like he wants to talk. Yes, unfortunately, I did want to inform council and the public that we are going to be canceling the March 25th uh, dump day because of the weather uh, and up at Ingalls. It's very muddy. It's going to rain a little more next week. It's going to be uh, still be muddy and the heavy trucks and material there. So we're going to cancel that event, but we're going to look at a date to reschedule in the future. Uh, so we still try to have two events for the year. Uh, so we'll, we'll come back to the public and reannounce it and advertise it when we get a new date set. Perfect. Any other city staff? City attorney. City manager. All right, city council. Council member Bash. Um, Lori, there were some good comments or interesting comments or important comments tonight about parking. Maybe we, if staff could look at that, try to figure it out because it's it is a good point. People do come with their horse trailers. I understand there's liabilities, but just find some kind of solution. Also. Um, I think I get they are right when you make that right turn on California, we may have to post that, which we're going to have to do something. Yeah, I would add too that normally Ingalls is open daily, but because of the mud and the conditions, the gates have been closed more frequently. But typically there, that parking lot is available and open on a daily basis unless there's some sort of event that lower parking lot. So we do have a great spot for people to bring trailers and certainly welcome folks to come in for the day there. Yeah, maybe we need to get the word out on that a little bit better. I know, I you know, I was, I do know when you go to the Veterans Memorial, that's always open. There's that huge parking lot right there, so maybe we just have to put that out there. Um, and then two things, just on kind of a personal level, I I will go. I know I'm probably the only one available, so I will go to the SCAG. It it is important. We we have to have a representative there, so I will go to that. Um, and then RCA wants me to go to Washington May 15th through the 19th, but we have a council meeting. And I believe it or not, in 14 years, I've missed one council meeting. But I'm just, and I'm feeling kind of funny about it. I'm just the vice chair right now, but I'm the chair to advocate. And I kind of want to get council's feeling on, I'll definitely have to go next year God willing, but is is it worth me missing a meeting? Well, I would just second. Um, there is also uh, I sit on the Mosquito Vector Board, and um, I have been asked to accompany them to go to D.C. as well. They're doing lobbying those same dates um, on that council meeting that We're I was going to bring together. up later. So that would yeah. mean two council people would not be here. 
Just what? saying, I zoomed from Maryland before zooming was a thing <laughs> back in the day. We'd but be if allowed it, to zoom? I don't know what the rules are. I don't think you could zoom, but we could do a uh, you could I do the traditional it. teleconference meeting where you post the door to your you post the door to a public room in the hotel, and the public can attend, and we we agendize it ahead of time, and and we can use Zoom, which just has to be a process where the public's allowed to go, and it's agendized, and. There, there, you have to work it out with the hotel to get a conference room in advance, 72 hours in advance. But we've done it before, and, and you could do it this way. If, if I may, Mayor, however, with a three-hour time difference, I'm not sure that it's um, it's um, helpful to have council members at a council meeting that would start at 10 p.m. their time in D.C. Um, that would be challenging. Have a majority. We would have a majority. I, I, I we could do that. We could try to start earlier. I would just say in general, I think it's always good to have council members advocating for our city in D.C. Uh, always a good idea. And we would have three. So um, and we can sort of plan the agenda accordingly right around your schedule. It well, makes sure we keep it light. I, so when I said adjust the agenda, I meant like farm stuff off to the meeting before or the meeting after. And if the the agreement is that we don't have that meeting, um, you know, to stack one agenda, stack the other agenda, just so we can do it that way, whatever would be the preference of staff. Yeah, we'll do it with three people. We'll manipulate the agenda <laughs> however you want. <laughs> okay. If you can't anyway, show I up, wanted, I just wanted to bring bad. it up because it sounds like you have two people gone and I'm feeling kind of guilty about it. So, Ten all right. Fine. That's all I have. Thank you. Council Member Alleman. Council Member Newton. Um, I just wanted to add on to what Kevin talked about uh, at 6 in California that I didn't quite understand the fencing. <sighs> the black chain link fence that we put up shouldn't impact any traffic because it's on the property line that's behind the trail fencing. So. I'm not sure if I was misunderstanding that um, from from the one resident, but also that <clears throat> that we maybe just get that word out in top stories or whatever that um, the lower arenas or the lower areas at Ingalls Park is open for people that haul in and want to take off from there, and it always has been. Okay, and uh, I mean, to me, it's obvious reasons why it's fenced from liabilities and keeping the semi trucks out and the homeless and uh, the neighbors to the west that run their business out of that property too. So um, that's all I wanted to see if we could maybe communicate some of those points. And Amanda, the fence looks really sharp. Looks good. <laughs> Thank you. All right. Uh, I will adjourn the meeting at 955.